Hello, everyone. Uh, it's lovely to see uh, people are joining us from all over the world. It is uh, a great pleasure and a great honor to host this roundtable uh, here with the Research Forum at the Quartal, uh, with a, a, a roundtable which sees together a group of scholars who collectively have contributed enormously to our knowledge of the art of Parmigianino. We are truly delighted that our speakers are, have joined us today. As you know, today's event complements uh, a display of the majority of the, the works by Parmigianino, uh, 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 which are part of the Quartal collection and which are now on display in the Quartal gallery. Uh, and a display and its related catalog that Ketty, Gottardo and I have co-curated. Uh, it, it's, it's important for me to say that this event started during the lockdown, during the most grim of the days of the first lockdown. And it was a means of bringing together students and curators, faculty and conservators in a collective effort to keep our intellectual uh, community alive and producting and in touch with each other. Uh, I thank deeply all the participants in this project. And I also thank very deeply our speakers today. Um, I don't think I shall say anything more, but, but and, and we'll then introduce our first speaker, Professor David Exurgeon, who really needs no introduction in this context. His fundamental monograph of 2006 is on all our shelves, along with his other numerous contributions on Parmigianino uh, and Correggio and all the artists and painters of Parma. I'm very thankful for his presence today with us, also because, in fact, he should not be here, probably, but should be at the National Gallery, where, as we speak, they are hanging the Raphael exhibition, which we all eagerly await. So without further ado, I I'm happy to leave the stage to David, who will talk to us about Parmigianino's handwritings. David, over to you. Thank you so much, Guido, and I hope you can hear me. It was stated that the connection was a bit strange, but I'm in the depths of the National Gallery, so that may represent uh, a problem. I uh, hope not. Anyway, I'm going to go straight into my talk and show you, I can find it, my PowerPoint and all that. Okay, so I will be very brief anyway. The basic idea here is to look at Parmigianino's different handwritings across his life in order to understand more above all about the dating of particular drawings, because as we all know, drawings can be connected with individual paintings and some of those paintings are commissioned and paid for and therefore have an approximate date range but it's nice to have a confirmation through handwriting on the whole handwriting on drawings can be by the artist it can of course also be by somebody else uh, but what i'm going to try to explain is that in the case of Parmigianino's first and third different handwritings that he uses across his life, we have what you might describe as independent confirmation that it's him. In relation to the second handwriting, it's just the number of different drawings which have that handwriting that points in that direction. So this is an autograph declaration. You can see that at the top it says, Nocta como mi Francesco di Mazzola. That's his proper name, Francesco Mazzola, uh, known as Parmigianino. 
uh, and he's agreeing to do various paintings uh, for the vault of the north transept of Parma Cathedral. And then he signs it again at the bottom. And this is the 21st of November, 1522. Next slide, please. And I hope you can see that in the case of the upper handwriting of the two different handwritings of this drawing on the right, which is in the British Museum, uh, the hand is the same. Uh, this would pretty straightforwardly indicate that that is him writing on his own drawing. In the nature of things, I should add, people write on their drawings after they've done the drawing. You don't normally do a drawing on a bit of paper you've been writing on. Uh, down below is a second handwriting, and this handwriting is found on a lot of drawings. It logically seems to come later and runs through a certain amount of his career. Next, please. It's loosely, anyway, related to a handwriting that tends to be known as the Cancelleresca Corsiva or the Corsivo. It's a version of the papal chancery hand. And you will notice that it's not joined up. That's one of the most obvious features of it. It is uh, fairly close. I'm not saying it's identical, but it's fairly close in a general way to the kinds of uh, hand that you find in printed sources. And what you're seeing on the left is a book published in Venice in 1514, Sigismondo Fanti's Teorica e Practica de Modo Scribendi, and so on. And on the right, actually, a rather later volume, which is the Aldine uh, Petrarch, and you can see a bit of verse at the top. Uh, it's, as I say, related in a general way to this hand. Next, please. This is the same British Museum drawing on the left, and what I'm showing you on the right is uh, handwriting coming through from the back of a sheet in Berlin. And I hope you can just about see that that's the same hand. Again, this sheet in Berlin is stuck down. Consequently, this is as near as we can get to seeing the handwriting. And I should say more generally that there are all sorts of interesting things to be said about what Parmigianino writes, but I'm not gonna go into that because I don't feel I have time to within the amount of minutes allotted to me. Next, please. The same hand is also found on the reverse of this double-sided drawing, uh, which you're seeing on the left. Uh, it's hand number two again, and this is a useful one in terms of a general establishment of chronology, because the female figure on the front is pretty clearly connected with Parmigianino's fresco of St. Agatha in one of the chapels of the Church of San Giovanni Evangelista. Parmigianino went to Rome in 1524. Uh, frescoes such as St. Agatha date from before that time. I don't think that's a very controversial observation. So he's using this hand uh, before he goes to Rome. Uh, next one, please. And you get it again towards the bottom left of this drawing, 
in the Toby collection in New York, and that too is connected with uh, a project from that pre-Roman first period in Parma, namely the fresco decoration in Fonte la Lata, which is what you're seeing on the right. Next, please. And you also find it, according to me anyway, on the middle writing that begins quando Madonna on this sheet in the Courtauld, and indeed on another uh, bit of what was originally the same piece of paper, uh, a now separated drawing in a private collection. I don't think the top two lines are Parmigianino, but I do think that Quando Madonna is the same hand. And I know I'm afraid that I'm in disagreement there with the court old exhibition catalog, but uh, we can't always all agree. Next, please. And <clears throat> I'm now showing you a very beautiful double-sided drawing in Würzburg, and I've blown up the one word on one of the sides which says pudicizia, and that too is in the hand. Obviously, constraints of time don't permit a letter by letter analysis, as it were, of the consistency of the forming of the letter P, but you can potentially, if you're skeptical, uh, consider, as it were, having the pleasure of going through all that in the privacy of your own homes. Uh, next, please. And here is some more writing. And again, it's the four lines in the middle, not the bit at the top that is the second hand. I have occasionally flirted with the idea that the top hand might be the first hand, but there's so little of it uh, that it's very hard to go on that. And this is a classic example, incidentally, of the victimhood that these bits of writing on the back of drawings suffer when they're snipped into uh, smaller scales because of what's on the front. Next, please. And one more, and it's the bit bottom right, not the rest. And another one, because I will otherwise overshoot. Next, please. And again, the bit at the bottom here, and that's fine. And more of the same as well. Next one. And here, interestingly, some numbers. And I think you can also as it were, attribute his numbers, because if you look at the way these numbers are done, and then next one, please, and that was incidentally with a tiny bit of his writing, and then more numbers here, so I'm comparing uh, the numbers on the sheet on the left of the numbers in the sheet on the right in Andre, and I hope you'll be able to see that they too basically correspond fives above all, uh, but also eights can be matched. Next, please. And interestingly enough, even this bit of musical score uh, looks as if it's likely to be from his hand. And that's not implausible because Vasari tells us that Parmigianino and Giovanni Antonio Lapoli practiced the lute together in Rome. They were musicians together in Rome. And next, please. And indeed, in this double-sided sheet in the Bonac collection, uh, you can see do, re, mi type musical um, notes being written down in the form of words. Next, please. And a landscape drawing on the left, and that has a line from Virgil's Aeneid, and on the right I'm showing you a printed version of uh, Virgil, which has not entirely dissimilar letters. Uh, next, please. 
And here, again, rather interesting that he's writing something in Latin about dividing up the human body. It seems to indicate that he probably did understand Latin somewhat. Next, please. I think I'll just jump over this one because time will run out and come to this crucial document. This is a uh, handwritten text uh, outlining what's it called in Italian, patti, sort of conditions, uh, things that will be done in connection with the fresco decoration in Santa Maria della Steccata. It's within a legal contract that it's in his hand. There are corrections and alterations in another hand, but the main hand is clearly his. And here too, we have a date. It's the 10th of May, 1531. This is the first appearance of the third hand. And since it begins by saying, I, Francesco Mazzola, it seems far-fetched not to believe it's his handwriting. And we'll find this on other drawings. Next, please. And very clearly, and that's a sort of um, signature or a trial anyway of his name, Franciscus Mausolus in Latin, on a drawing that is indeed connected with the Staccata project. And this hand is really quite strikingly different from the previous one. I don't think they could be confused. Next, please and occurs on a number of late drawings, uh, notably a number connected with the Staccata project. And the Staccata project goes from that original contract of 1531 through effectively till the end of his life and certainly till he does a runner from Parma in 1539. And this is a drawing, double-sided drawing in, in Modena. Next, please. And that's a close up of the text on it at the uh, top right. And you can compare it, I hope, with the writing of the document. And then you see another chunk of it, uh, bottom right. And again, that's connected with uh, one of the virgins uh, of the staccata. And then next, please. Uh, and you can see it here too, even though the uh, words have been crossed out, they're still perfectly legible and they're still clearly in that hand. And this is on the back of the drawing for the Madonna of the Long Neck, uh, for which he uh, starts to work in 1534. So this is all going on in the 1530s, uh, the last decade of his life. Next, please. And Another dated one, uh, 1537, on uh, the 22nd of December, he says, I gave two scudi to Mr. Damiano, and Damiano de Plata was somebody who was an associate, effectively, of his. Next one, please. Then, almost finally, this is an interesting case. This is a letter that Parmigianino wrote to Giulio Romano, and Giulio Romano sent it back to the authorities at the Staccato, which is why, in effect, it's been preserved. And this is written very, very late on, really just months before he dies, in the year of his death, on the 4th of April, 1540. But according to me, at any rate, only the signature is in his hand and the rest is not. I don't believe it's a sort of fourth handwriting of his. I think he employed an amanuensis. He got somebody else to write his letter. This was a sort of, um, as it were, 16th century version of having a stenographer. Next, please. Uh, where did this handwriting come from? Well, possibly it's connected with um, Ugo da Capi. Uh, we know 
that Uba de Carpi was a collaborator of uh, Parmigianino's in the world of printmaking uh, on such works as this Chiaroscuro woodcutter Diogenes. And next, please. But he also produced uh, the painting on the right, which is based on a drawing by Parmigianino, uh, painting, we're told by the side, that was done, as it were, without a paintbrush. And that may very possibly have been connected with the Jubilee of 1525. Next, please. Why do I think uh, Girolamo, I'm sorry, not Girolamo de Capi, Ugo de Capi has any part in all this? Well, the answer is that there are two books, the Tesauro de Scrittori, which you see here, a sort of anthology of writing, 1525. And next, please. And here you can see that there are lots of sort of alphabets and bits and pieces. And there's another book as well, the La Operina da Imparare di Scrivere Littera Cancellaresca, that's 1522. And Uga da Capi was involved in um, making the pages. Uh, he was effectively the designer, and therefore uh, it's not at all far-fetched, I would say, that Parmigianino might have come across these books, because they also date from the time when they were pals together in Rome. Next, please. Uh, you can't, or I haven't succeeded in getting any one particular hand to match up perfectly. So it's not that he narrowly copied one hand, but I think he was aware of this kind of material. And it's a different version of a chancery hand, but it's quite distinct from hand number two. And next, please. And there's another variant, and we may be getting near the end. You may be relieved to know. Next, please. And there's yet another one, uh, and it actually makes reference there towards the bottom of the word cancellaresca. And next, if there is a next, no, there isn't a next. So I'm done, I hope. Uh, thank you. So if, if you have any questions, uh, can you please put them in the chat and I will read uh, those uh, and ask David to, to comment. My, uh, if I can break the ice and say, and ask David whether this method has been useful for you in identifying uh, drawings or dating drawings, have you been able to, uh, to, to put it to use in relation to the drawings, to the visual uh, the figures in, in the sheets? It's, it's, a, it's a very fair question. I think the simple answer is that we reckon to know quite a lot about the chronology of Parmigianino's drawings. And I'm only suggesting, of course, that these hands run for a number of years, not that they last for six months or something. <laughs> but the truth is that very, very often our judgments about drawings are intelligent guesses rather than absolute certainties. The number of documented drawings from the Renaissance is very few. So having what you might describe as an outside reassurance or confirmation seems to me a good idea. Uh, the other point which I have left out of this presentation that did address in the larger version is that there are one or two borderline drawings which have what seems to be the wrong handwriting, so to speak. Uh, and therefore, you might quite seriously wonder in those cases whether that drawing is going to be a Parmigianino drawing. So it may almost be better for excluding than for, including. I okay. see. Excluding isn't such a bad idea either. <laughs> Absolutely. 
Um, so I, I, I'm seeing a few questions. Someone, uh, sorry, uh, who, uh, I don't know who, whose name is that? Uh, she or he, are, they are asking uh, whether did you um, avail yourself of any expert handwriting specialist uh, to kind of look at their inscriptions? Or well, the, the, the answer is that the reason I've never moved from giving this as a lecture in 2010 to now is that I've had a long term but unfulfilled notion of having a meeting with somebody who is a great expert and we've talked about oh we must do it sometime and somehow in the <laughs> chaos of life we've never done it but no it's a very legitimate question because as it were it's a bit as if i'm a dentist or something and i'm being asked to do a heart transplant <laughs> um, i would prefer to have the assistance of a cardiologist if that's required um, well, a message that is more a message than a question, probably. Um, David, I think I'm remiss in not sending you a photo of the Capodimonte example. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, this is Claire, Van Yes. But, um, well, I, I uh, know you've matched up some sheets that have been cut down, like the court of one, but I'm curious if you have gone through them systematically to see if any two drawings match? I believe I, I believe I have and have not succeeded in putting Humpty Dumpty together again. I think I have thought about trying to do that and haven't cracked it. I think at the beginning of considering the problem, I imagined that I'd hit the jackpot that way and failed. <laughs> And, and another question is whether you were able to relate changes in handwriting to changes in drawing style. Not in a precise way, no. But the other thing, if I'm allowed, as it were, to add a footnote to myself, I didn't really say because I was sprinting along, is my instinct is that, as it were, between each handwriting, he's doing the equivalent of um, Eliza Doolittle in My Fair Lady and moving from a more kind of commonplace handwriting to a grander one. So he's, as it were, elevating himself culturally. I had this, I had this feeling that it became more and more formal, more and more yeah, uh, or formalized. Um, a subsequent question is, um, does this do anything to further confirm Ugo and Parmigianino's direct collaboration? Or how do you read in the handwriting in the context of Parmigianino's print production? Uh, I don't know, it, this is more to do with the relationship with Ugo, the Carpi. Well, if, if, the notion that he was familiar with uh, these books is accepted, then it doesn't exactly uh, diminish the connection between him and Ungo. Um, but it doesn't absolutely confirm it because as it happens, presumably if there's a book, anybody within reason can get hold of the book. So you don't have to be somebody's friend to have their books. I mean, I do think that everything seems to be coming together a bit, but I don't want to push it too far. And um, well, the, 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 the next one is the question I wanted to ask you, also, even if you said you wouldn't go in the, into that direction. Um, do these, these lines allow us to understand the readings of Parmigianino, what Parmigianino was reading uh, beyond Virgin? Well, yes, I believe they do. I mean, not everything by any means has been identified, but Mary Vaccaro, who's one of our speakers, has managed to identify a number of uh, Italian passages as coming from Petrarch. Uh, I think normally from not the Canzoniere, but from the less obvious Rime Sparse. 
And what I can also say in a very general way, uh, because I've more recently done a lot of this in, in different contexts, is that I think art historians have been rather slow in a general way to think of using Google in the modern world just to put almost any inscription into Google and see what comes out at the other end. Uh, because there are all sorts of really peculiar, obscure texts that even great classical scholars don't know, uh, which will be online and therefore you will be led straight to them. Um, and my book I've just last year published on all species has uh, a number of examples of this, but you know, somebody called Silius Italicus is not, frankly, everybody's bedtime reading, uh, nor probably ever was, but he was used by um, Niccolo Alunno, uh, amazingly enough. Um, the, the next question, and I think then we have to move on, uh, is, um, um, since other artists who were contemporaries of Parmigianino were also trained in to write in the Cancelleresca uh, scripts, are, are the individual styles of handwriting distinctive enough to make attributions? Well, I think the simple answer is that if you get a lot of drawings, and in the case of the second hand, I think it's about 20 that seem to have a handwriting. Unless you want to believe that there's some kind of graffiti king, a sort of uh, Cinquecento Banksy, who's got hold of Parmigianino's drawings after Parmigianino and written all over them, it just seems logical to assume that that's him. Uh, as it happens, there have been quite serious studies of Mantegna's handwriting and Michelangelo's handwriting, probably others as well, but those are the ones I can think of immediately. And if you look at those hands, they're not the same. I mean, the other general observation to make is that at least in the days when people used to send each other handwritten letters, uh, when I was Young, for example, if a letter arrived, I would know normally just looking at the address on the outside who was writing to me because I recognized that hand. Uh, the idea of, as it were, attributing a handwriting is not particularly peculiar. Having said that, uh, in the larger form of the lecture, I ended up on a note of caution because there's a bit in Twelfth Night where there's a whole discussion about how Malvolio is convinced that he can recognize a handwriting and he says these be her very C's, her U's and her T's and thus make she her great P's. It is in contempt of question her hand. Malvolio says it's Olivia's hand. But it turns out uh, that it's Olivia's waiting gentlewoman, Maria, who has forged her hand. So a note of caution, maybe. And, and finally, I would ask, I can't resist asking you whether you have found, by and large, a relationship between the inscriptions and the drawings, or they are, by and large, completely unrelated. I'm not completely unrelated. <laughs> okay, that was quick. <laughs> uh, so I don't see other questions coming in. And so I would like to thank you, David, for your contribution, uh, which uh, enriches our understanding of Parmigianino and show us a, an artist who seems to become more uh, increasingly Sure of himself, or rather formalizing his own uh, presentation through more and more 
uh, form of writing. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting thought that I'd never uh, had. <laughs> Thank you. And may I just say publicly, because of this National Gallery commitment, I'm now going to vanish. I will look forward to hearing everybody being brilliant at a later point because these are being recorded, but I won't be part of question and answer from now on. We, we are sorry of that, but we understand entirely <laughs> and, and, and look forward to seeing the, the, the exhibitions. Right. Well, I'm going to mute myself and vanish. And thank you. So uh, thank you. It, it's a pity that David can't be with us any farther, but uh, it was good of him to be <laughs> presenting anyway. So our next speaker um, is equally uh, uh, an important uh, scholar of Parmigianino. So it's, uh, it's really uh, not necessary to introduce her uh, very much. She's uh, a professor at the University of Texas at Arlington and wrote uh, a, a beautiful monograph uh, on Permigianino in 2002. I must say one of the most beautifully illustrated books on Parmigianino or of any on any artist of the 16th century. And she also uh, um, edit, um, published an edited volume and uh, wrote several many contributions on Parmigianino and the artists of Parma. Uh, so um, Mary Vaccaro will be talking to us today about her new findings uh, in the Parma baptism baptismal registers regarding Parmigianino. And, and I look forward to hearing this new documentary information we can still gather from the archive. Uh, thank you, Mary, for accepting our invitation and I'll leave it uh, to you uh, straight away. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to see if I can succeed in sharing my screen. Around uh, 1530, after time spent away from, uh, in, in Rome and Bologna, Francesco Mazzola, better known as Parmigianino, returned home. He undertook several important commissions in Parma, yet seems to have had difficulty bringing these projects to term. The most notorious episode involves the decoration of the Church of Santa Maria della Steccata, where his procrastination so incurred the wrath of the local confraternity he was, that he was briefly jailed then decamped to Casal Maggiore, a nearby town outside of Parma's uh, legal jurisdiction, where he unexpectedly died soon thereafter in 1540. According to Vasari, a consuming obsession with alchemy had led the artist astray. Vasari vividly describes how Parmigianino, once gentle in appearance, turned into a bearded savage with long unruly hair, quasi un uomo salvatico, Sorry, says, wasting time over alchemical furnaces when he should instead have been racking his brains to devise beautiful inventions for his brush. Yet the sheer quantity of his extant drawings for the Staccata project and for the so-called Madonna of the Long Neck, the famous altarpiece on which he was simultaneously engaged, belies the Sari's accusation. Parmigino appears to have spent an extraordinary amount of time devising and reworking beautiful inventions, even if he was slow to translate them into paint. Today, I wish to focus not so much on Parmigio's inventive drawings. This is a theme of, of course, the Courthold exhibition and a topic that many of my esteemed colleagues and I have widely explored. But um, as Guido uh, uh, mentioned, I'm going to kind of uh, think about some newly discovered documents that likewise challenge Masari's popular story. And for this, we turn to the registers of the Parma Baptistry. Let me just see if I can make this bigger. Now, baptismal registers are repositories of potentially rich, uh, though often understudied documentary evidence about artists in early modern Europe. The Christian ritual of baptism operates both vertically and horizontally. So that's to say that uh, you are not only a godparent, becomes not only the spiritual parent of the child, but also the co-parent of the parents, the child's parents. And the resulting kinship known as confraternitas has long offered a fundamental way to forge and solidify alliances among friends, neighbors, and business associates. 15 years ago, in an essay titled Artists as Godfathers, Parmigianino and Correggio in the Baptismal Registers of Parma, and uh, that appeared in uh, Renaissance Studies, 
I published an entry that demonstrates that Palmagino brought a daughter of a local painter, Michelangelo Anselmi, to the font in 1532. There had been some scholarly confusion about whether or not he had done this, and I found the entry. It turns out, however, that this was neither the first nor the only time that Palmaginino, who apparently um, didn't have children of his own, served in such a capacity. And these newly discovered entries reveal that he stood as godfather at least um, three more times in the last decade of his career. And so today I'm going to talk a little bit about this and uh, in order to map a social network and consider its potential for understanding uh, artistic exchange. First, however, um, I'd like very briefly to explain why I resumed such research after 15 years. And it has to do with, uh, as Guido said, the pandemic. Because of the pandemic in March of 2020, only days after opening, a, an exhibition of spectacular works at the, uh, from the Museo di Capodimonte in Naples that was here at the Kimball Art Museum, and I'm, I'm uh, speaking to you from Fort Worth, Texas, uh, was shuttered. So the, the exhibition was shuttered. And when it eventually did reopen with safety protocol that summer, I basically, that was the only thing I did. I donned my N95 mask and I visited several times a week, once chancing upon um, this delightful pair of ladies in period costume. Now this extended encounter with Parmigino's Antea, shown here, led me to reprise an argument that I had made in another essay uh, nearly a decade ago. And the essay to which I'm referring here is called True Beauties and it appeared in Apollo in 2013. And in that essay, I, um, I thought about uh, whether or not this actually might be a real person rather than an ideal or an abstract ideal of female beauty. And I, um, as Elizabeth Proper and uh, Christiana, Christiana Nelson and others had uh, previously thought that this was an ideal uh, of beauty, but I became more and more convinced that it was a real person however idealized. Oh, sorry, there. Uh, a real person, however much idealized. And to this point, uh, I'd like to just introduce very quickly this intriguing, if somewhat abraded drawing in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, likely by uh, Parmigio's cousin, Jerome Mazzola Bedoli. Uh, and there's a, there's a, uh, the other side is another drawing, which I'm not going to get into right now. Uh, but uh, this, this side here uh, depicts the same sitter, it seems. And it's not a copy after the picture, uh, it seems to me, but may record a lost preparatory drawing. And if anyone has any thoughts on this matter during the q and I would uh, be very grateful to hear them. David, a uh, surgeon and I have discussed this and I've discussed this as well with Paul Ioannidis, but I, I'd be grateful for any other insight. So Parmigio's Antea, as many of you know, has long been associated with uh, an eponymous Roman courtesan, uh, and a, a proposal that is deeply unsatisfactory on many levels, in, uh, including stylistic. The picture uh, to me and many others is very clearly a second uh, Parma period, so later dating. Uh, moreover, as I pointed out in that article in 2013, the name Antea was regularly given to girls in Parma during the 16th century. And I had discovered this fun fact uh, while trying to track down the baptismal entry I mentioned earlier, that one with uh, Michelangelo and Selmi and Parmigianino. Uh, so going through the registers, I, I realized that Antea showed up as a name. And, and you know, uh, previously, you know, we'd only thought Antea was a Roman courtesan, right? So this was a name that was given to girls in Parma. So my renewed contact with the portrait during the otherwise my otherwise cloistered summer of 2020 led me back to the registers to try to work out which of these girls uh, our sitter might be. And uh, this is, you know, watch this space to be continued. But in a wonderful circularity, while searching for Antea this time, I found previously unknown mentions of Parmigianino and various local artists. And I began to map their social networks. First, uh, since maybe some of you are not as familiar with uh, baptismal registers, I just wanted briefly to uh, give a concise overview of what they are as primary sources. And uh, so they obviously are registering the names of, uh, of individuals who come to the baptismal font, right? Uh, and it's uh, in the 16th century, uh, in the second half of the 16th century, this was very regulated by the Council of Trent uh, because uh, previously uh, parishes did not necessarily record the names. Uh, in some cases, uh, children might have many, many godparents. So the Council of Trent 
made it obligatory to record uh, baptisms, Christian baptisms, and also to uh, it regulated the the number of uh, children who could bring, who could excuse me the number of godparents uh, each child could have. In Parma, the commune had already uh, issued a decree in the late 15th century. So by 1459 in Parma, uh, they're actually recording uh, uh, the baptisms of children. And there is no systematic survey of these baptisms, uh, but I've gone through um, basically a century of them. And uh, it's, uh, I think, really interesting for pre-Tridentine kinds of uh, insight into what the sacrament meant in Parma at least. Uh, these extant records can be fragmentary, especially in the first volume, where entire uh, years are missing, uh, and the ch handwriting changes because there are different scribes who undertook the task, even during the same period, uh, uh, and the basic information changes over time as well. Uh, it seems to me that originally only the father is identified as the parent of a given infant, which makes sense because probably the uh, mother was uh, in confinement, but then by 1506, the mother's uh, first name regularly appears, along with her relationship to the father. And as you would imagine, the most common designation is uxor, wife. Uh, yet other labels, uh, which I found amusing, concubina and amica, suggest that marriage was hardly a requirement. These registers yield fascinating I think, data about socio-historical topics ranging from the frequency of out-of-wedlock births uh, to the relative popularity of names, uh, for example, the name Antea in Parma. These baptismal registers also shed light on everyday lives of people, and in our case, the artists in, uh, such as Parma Giannino. And already in the 18th century, the erudite local historian Padre Irenio Arjo had pointed to their importance. Uh, and he used the baptismal registers to uh, establish Parmigino's birth date, precise birth date. There had been, again, confusion about that. And incidentally, one of the uh, notes in uh, NFO's uh, biography of Parmigino has a withering rebuttal to a critic who had questioned the importance of uh, baptismal registers and, and information. If anyone wants to know what that is, I can tell you later. Researchers began to mine the registers, uh, particularly uh, Enrico Scarabelli Zunti, whose work is unfortunately remains largely unpublished in the 19th century. And then uh, Ladadeo Testi, who created uh, genealogical trees, uh, for example, this one of the Mazzola family. Uh, this was published in 1910, uh, however, without mention of godparents. Uh, Giovanni Copertini, uh, in his monograph of 1932, was the first to transcribe the entry for Parmigiano's baptism, and then um, the, the entries for his siblings uh, have, since in, since, have since seen publication by, uh, relatively recently, by Mazzio Dall'Acqua in 2001, and Dall'Acqua rightly emphasized their value in helping to understand the family, so, uh, the, family the Mazzola family's social status. Uh, it turns out that uh, Parmigianino's father Filippo and two of his uncles, well, we, they were painters, as, as we well know, but they also had impressive connections. And I just wanted briefly to say, uh, so the, the uh, uh, godparents of Parmigianino's siblings are known and have been published, but it, it, uh, the entries for the children of Michele and Pierolario uh, have not. And it seems to me that perhaps they should be because uh, I came across, for example, one of the daughters of uh, Michele, uh, uh, the, the uncle of Parmigianino, and uh, among the godparents uh, were, was Avis uh, Giovanna da Piacenza, better known as Correggio's patron for the Camera di San Paolo. And uh, it doesn't seem a coincidence that Michele Mazzola, uh, around the same time, got a commission to work in that convent, the same convent. Uh, fellow artists, uh, so what I'm saying here is basically that uh, you can use this to kind of reconstruct social networks uh, between artists and patrons, but you also can use this information to reconstruct uh, social networks among artists. And fellow artists were often entrusted with the honor. For example, um, the local goldsmith, Giovan uh, Francesco Bonsagni, brought one of Parmigino's brothers to the font. And this has long been known, but um, the significance of it has gone unremarked, as far as I can tell. And as we shall see, Bonsagni later enlisted Parmigianino to return the favor. 
So as uh, David Exurgeon mentioned, uh, Parmigiano went by um, a shortened name uh, and showed us some documents, Francesco Mazzola. He is, was christened actually, Girolamo Francesco Maria Mazzola. And this, the shortened name, Francesco Mazzola, appears as the godfather of record nearly a dozen times in the baptistry registers during the first three decades of the 16th century. And here I really thought it was important to err on the side of caution when attempting to make a positive identification because of um, there are possible homonyms. Uh, and I found, for example, an entry for a certain Francesco Mazzola um, a posthumous entry for a child uh, of a certain Mazzola in 1536, and that's four years before Parmigiano's death. So I, I did exercise a lot of caution when making these identifications. But our, our Parmigianino can be confidently identified in at least four entries that date from 1531 until 1538. As already mentioned in uh, 1532, our Parmigianino Sorry, it's there. Our Parmigianino brought a daughter of Michelangelo and Selmi to the font. And I use the present occasion uh, to introduce a detail uh, of an altarpiece by Anselmi. Uh, uh, for, it's for the Parmis, it was for the Parmis Church of Santo Stefano, but it's now in the Louvre. Uh, and it's surely, I think, inspired by this early drawing by Parmigianino in Red Shock, which uh, as it turns out is today also at the Louvre. Uh, and this to me suggests uh, that the, the two co-parents were uh, sharing drawings and uh, uh, the altarpiece that you see on the right, that detail uh, is dated uh, exactly around the time that uh, the baptism took place incidentally. And it's almost certainly are, so the Anselmi I had, found that earlier, but th these are the, I'm just gonna talk very quickly about three uh, new instances uh, where Parmigio served as godfather. So it's almost certainly our Parmigianino who brought a newborn child of Giovanni Francesco Bonzani to the font a year earlier in 1531. Now Bonzani uh, may not be a household name, but he was actually quite important in Parma. He was a town elder, uh, he oversaw the civic mint, and he was part of an important family of goldsmiths. Uh, two of his older sons, uh, Gian Giacomo and Giovan Francesco uh, Federico, continued to practice the trade, actually moving to Rome uh, to work for Pope Paul III Farnese, as did their nephew, uh, Lorenzo Fragni. And as we noted uh, just a little while ago, Bonzani, Giovan Francesco, had already established ties with the Mazzola clan because he had stood godfather for one of Parmigio's brothers three decades earlier. The fact that Parmigianino likewise became a co-parent, further reinforcing these bonds of kinship between the families, I think points to the tight-knit communities among artists and artisans working in Parma. And incidentally, uh, Parmigio's aunt, Massina, was also married to a goldsmith, and, uh, Andrea Guido Rossi. And uh, David uh, Exurgeon, in his monograph, astutely pointed to this avuncular connection in relation to Parmigino's own drawings for jewelry and metalwork. And so I think it's worth thinking about uh, further uh, about uh, Parmigino's drawings, but also his, the, the, the way that uh, jewelry shows up in his paintings. And I show here two details of works from the uh, last decade of his uh, career, uh, given these ties, these close ties to the Bonzani. There can be little doubt um, over Parmigiano's involvement in another baptism four years later, uh, because the father, and this name has already come up as has the drawing in David's presentation just a little while ago, was one of uh, Parmigiano's closest friends, Damiano Pieti, uh, to whom he gave, uh, uh, as David said, uh, two scudi in 1537 on the back of the drawing there. Uh, and uh, uh, Pieti was one of the earliest translators and illustrators of Alberti's treatise on building. He was responsible, he was an architect himself, even though nothing survives. He was also responsible for preparing the um, chapel for the Madonna of the Long Neck. Uh, and that document of 1534, uh, which is many times erroneously called the contract for the altarpiece is actually not the contract. Uh, it is uh, a, an agreement to ready the chapel for the altarpiece. So Parmigio was already at work uh, in 1534, but Damiano Pieti was the person going to, he was going to make those architectural modifications. And uh, presumably he did uh, because we have uh, epigraphic evidence. 
He was also the guarantor of uh, his friend's protracted fresco project in the Staccata during these same years. And uh, if anyone's interested, there's more to that particular entry because there's yet another uh, artist involved. And, and then Rondini comes in uh, later uh, to, be the, uh, to be the godfather of yet another of Damiano Petti's children. Finally, uh, in 1538, Parmigianino once again stood godfather, this time for a son born to Giuseppe Zanguidi. Uh, that same year, Giuseppe, uh, who was the son of a local woodcarver and future father of the more famous uh, or better known painter Jacopo uh, Zanguidi, uh, known as Bortoia, was assisting Parmigianino in Santa Maria della Steccata. So this Giuseppe Guazzini was one of his gazzone. And he was one of three devoted followers uh, whom the master subsequently appointed as his testamentary heir. Uh, he may also have accompanied Parmigianino to Casal Maggiore, where the latter fled to escape his legal woes uh, with a staccata confraternity and unexpectedly died soon thereafter, uh, as we mentioned in August of 1540. And this drawing in the B British Museum uh, may record their trip across the Po as Elisabetta Fada has suggestively proposed, although Zangrandi would have been 30, uh, not a minor at the time. At all events, the newly discovered entry uh, between, uh, Zang, excuse me, Zanguidi, not Zangrandi, Zanguidi and Parmigianino uh, confirms their deep bonds of kinship. And so too does the name that Giuseppe Zanguidi uh, would give another of his sons born less than a year after uh, his mentor's death. Uh, he was, the, the boy was, uh, the boy was christened uh, Francesco, surely in uh, Parmigianino's honor. And the final slide. Thus, in the near dozen mentions of Francesco Mazzola as godfather found in the registers of Parma Baptistry, at least four entries and almost uh, perhaps others, but all these four almost certainly, uh, certainly refer to our artist. For almost a decade before his departure for Casal Maggiore, various friends and colleagues, a goldsmith, an architect, a loyal assistant among them, entrusted him with the honor of bringing their children to the font. What emerges defies the uh, still popular tale first spun by Vasari about Parmigino's fall from grace. The baptismal registers offer a decidedly more positive scenario, better aligned with this late self-portrait. Here, above his head, as if embodying the shifting patterns of his imagination, the artist, hardly a bearded savage, drew two of the lovely figures that eventually became over the course of yet other drawings, the wise and foolish virgins, that he painted in the Staccata Church. So too, the baptismal registers attest to Parmigino's ongoing ties to his larger community during the last decade of his career, a measure of his abiding sociability and the esteem with which his compatriots continue to embrace him as kin. Thanks. Thank you, Mary, very much for this uh, brilliant presentation that sets Parmigianino finally in, in a context and not as a kind of uh, a declining <laughs> artist, but put, puts him in relation with other artists. It's a, it's a, a brilliant way of, of finding these connections um, and, and give a refreshing our views of the artists. I would take uh, questions direct, uh, right now at this point on this paper. Um, someone, uh, Katie, uh, is asking a very precise question. Is there a date for Damiano Pieti's chris, uh, christening? Is there a date for, for the... Yes, uh, I don't have the dates here. I just have the year, but obviously I've transcribed them all. Um, so I... The christening of the christening of the um, just a second. So the christening of the of Damiano Pieti's um, child, uh, right? It took place. I, I don't want to. I, it, it's well, just, I don't want. I don't have the four years later. So uh, four years later. Maybe from, you can you can put the data in the chat whenever you find been, it. It should have been. Uh, it, it would have been in fourteen thirty five, I believe. Uh, I can look. Uh, let me just. If I can look very easily, but I don't have the. the, the don't, don't worry. I think. You, uh, yeah, you can I think put it's it. fourteen thirty five. Uh, and then what happens is that uh, uh, after uh, five years later. Uh, Parmigiano has passed away, right? And uh, and 
Damiano Pietri has another son and uh, Rondini becomes the godfather of that son. So, so uh, uh, at any rate, there's lots of dates, but yes, uh, I see uh, Alessandro's. Uh, yes, uh, the question is, I'm going to translate it for everyone, buddy. So if this uh, baptismal, uh, baptismal records, um, they are all after 1530. And if you have found any uh, mention of him uh, before, uh, that date, and she's adding perhaps uh, yeah, in an earlier period, he was not of age, he was not. Yeah, yeah, so Alessandra and I are often in contact, and I'm, 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 very, I'm very much uh, uh, in communication with her and Christiana uh, Cecchinelli because they're wonderful uh, resources for anything uh, that has to do with archives in Parma. I did find some earlier uh, I did some I find some earlier notices, but I'm 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 a little bit reluctant because, um, as Alessandra well knows, uh, that um, the um, um, the registers when they were first instituted in the, uh, the one of the one of the regulations was that uh, godparents should be at least 25 years of age. So I'm a little, although there are some exceptions as uh, uh, Christiana Ciaccanelli and I have discussed. So there are a, a few, but, I, but, but I'm, I'm a little bit more cautious about those because there are other people who obviously have this name. Um, and I mentioned that uh, entry for the, uh, the, the, the person who, who had a child uh, and his child had been brought to the font posthumously, this Francesco Mazzola, and this was uh, well before our, our Parmigino's death. So, so just need to be really careful about homonyms. Thank you. Another question from Jane Cooper. Do the baptismal records put Parmigianino as the most senior and significant person in this network you are uh, um, reconstructing? I wonder if you think it was a deliberate strategy to build his network or was he responding to demand uh, from others who depended on him as a master of a workshop, for example. So what is the relative position of Parmigianino with respect to the other members of this artistic community that you are trying to sketch out? Yeah, that's a great, uh, great question. And I don't think that the answer is, uh, there's a uniform answer for, because all of these, um, for example, Anselmi, they, they've known each other for years because they were working uh, uh, in San, San Giovanni Evangelista in the 1520s. So those are, are more kind of uh, contemporaries and sort of equal. Uh, uh, with uh, Zanguidi, he's clearly a, somebody who works under Parmigianino. Damiano Pitti, more of a colleague as well. Bonzani would have been quite old. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm not sure that, uh, I'm not saying that necessarily Parmigino is the most important figure in this, but rather that uh, by setting up these networks, uh, they, they help each other, yes. And I think that's another question in the chat as well. Like what, 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 what does a godparent do for a godchild? Yes. Yeah, and so uh, I'm less interested in the child and more interested right now in the social network among the, the parents. Does that make sense, this, uh, the co-parents? Yes, uh, technically a baptized child, someone, I see someone else has written, uh, would be responsible for the child. Um, I think that's technically how it works. But, but in terms of, uh, and again, I'm not a social historian, but what I've read is, is that uh, in early, the early modern period, this was also just used for a massive kinship. You know, sometimes an entire town could take uh, a child to the fount. It's, it's incredible. Uh, and that's why the Council of Trent made it very strict. Uh, so only one parent, uh, only one godparent, or at least at the, at the most one godparent, uh, one, uh, one female, one male godparent. Does that make sense? So that you couldn't bring so many children to, you, you couldn't have so many godparents, but it was a way of creating a network. Uh, and sometimes it was a way of currying favor with people who are even beneath you uh, for example, you might, uh, my understanding is that you, know, you might have a balia or somebody just to ensure that this kind of social uh, fabric, uh, yeah. This is fascinating. Do, do you see patrons and artists mixing up in this kind of relations or is mostly an, among artists who? 
That's a great question too. So again, I have, this is, it's not like a definitive survey that I've made, but I, I do have more information about a relatively obscure artist, uh, uh, Rondani. And Rondani, although he serves as godfather, it seems for, uh, uh, for, for other artists, he does not choose god, godparents who are artists which I think is interesting. His are, are much more kind of elevated, um, sort of elite kind of figures of society. And it might speak a little bit to his own social status. We don't really know very much about him. Um, but for, uh, there's, I think there's a mix, like uh, obviously for Parmigianino, he never had children that we know of, uh, but Anselmi, I've tracked his, uh, Anselmi is, uh, he has patrons, but he also has artists. And uh, Brilliant. Again, so putting them all together really gives uh, a fabric of yeah, the, yeah, uh, it's it's kind of like uh, you were saying about how kinships you, you brought this um, uh, exhibition together because of the, the COVID and the pandemic, you know, in a way, like I, I was so uh, desperate for social interaction that I brought together these, you know, these, you know, because because really it is it's like Facebook or, you know, Insta I mean, it's a, it's a social network that we've you know, this, that you can map out. Yeah. Thank you. I've got the last two questions, then we have to move on. Sorry. Uh, Andre asking, great, don't thank you. In my experience, looking at baptismal records for Doni family early in 16th century, Ken. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know Florence's records, Andre. Uh, and hello, Andre, thanks for joining. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of literature, but I've never looked at the uh, uh, Florentine uh, baptismal registers. So I would think that the godparents needed to be registered. But again, before the Council of Trent, all of this was very unregulated, my understanding. And so that sometimes parishes don't even record, sometimes they do. I was quite intrigued, and I know I don't want to keep us, but I was kind of intrigued to find so many uh, amiche and concubine, like among the, uh, you know. Mothers. Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the last question I can take is from Maria Rezin, and she's asking why Antea was so popular in Parma and completely unknown in most other Italian cities. I agree, I've, I've gone through hundreds of death records in Mantua and never found, never remember an Antea. Ah, that's, yeah. Uh, so I was very surprised to find it as well when I, uh, you know, this was uh, 15 years ago, uh, but it seems to have been a popular, but again, it's not as if all the girls have it. I mean, I, I went through this time and very systematically tried to, it, it's, you know, one or two girls out of, you know, 300 girl. I mean, I haven't done the exact statistics no. on it, you know, uh, so it's not the most popular, but there are lots of really strange names in Parma, like yeah. really wonderful, like, um, and, I, and Athea is a name that has, uh, it, it, there is a literary, I mean, it, there is a, a negative mythological, but there's also a, a positive literary uh, references to it. And there are these wonderfully literary names that people have in uh, uh, girls and boys, some boys, yeah, so. Yeah. Thank you very much, you. Mary. That, that was wonderful, really fascinating uh, presentation. I would now leave it to Katie to introduce our next speakers. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I want to join you in thanking Mary for yeah for the wonderful presentation, really uh, terrific, and um, and I'm delighted now to present the next the two speakers who are going to actually uh, share their presentation. They are going to give their presentation uh, together, and Catherine Jenkins and Naoko Taka Akate, Taka Take. Um, so Catherine Jenkins is an independent art historian and former curator of prints in at the Metro. Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Her publications include prints at the court of Fontainebleau, um, which, um, which covered the period from 1542 to 47, and uh, which consisted of uh, three volumes, and, um, and numerous articles on 16th century printmaking. She was the co-curator of the recent Metropolitan Museum exhibition on the Renaissance etching, in which part of her work on uh, Parmigianino's etchings was published. And um, she's still currently uh, working on Parmigianino's etchings. 
Naoko is curator of prints and drawings at the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles. And prior to joining the Getty Research Institute in 2019, she was the curator of prints and drawings at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, also in Los Angeles. Naoko has curated and co-curated exhibitions of works on paper from the Renaissance to the present. She is a specialist in 16th and 17th century Italian print history, and she organized the 2018 exhibition on the Chiaroscuro Woodcut in Renaissance Italy and edited the accompanying catalog. And so it's really my pleasure to introduce you um, now and to give you actually the floor. Now it's to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ketty, and thank you, Guido, for organizing this roundtable and for inviting Catherine and me to join. Um, it's a great pleasure to be sharing the Zoom floor with Catherine, who has been a very generous thought partner over the years on the subject of Parmigianino and printmaking. And so I will begin the presentation and then I will hand it off to Catherine. Um, much has been written, uh, including by authors present in our gathering, about Parmigianino's profound, profound and richly varied engagement with printmaking. The circulation in Rome of prints after the inventions of artists Parmigianino admired, such as those after Raphael by Marcantonio Raimondi and his contemporaries, may well have attracted the young painter to the idea of working with printmakers. In his first printmaking venture in and around 1526, Parmigianino created four designs for the engraver Giovanni Jacopo Coraglio. In Bologna from around 1527 to 1530, he went on to collaborate with chiaroscurists and further created some of the earliest and most consequential etchings of the Italian Renaissance. It is this Bolognese printmaking enterprise in which Parmigianino transformed the two nascent mediums of chiaroscuro woodcut and etching that will be the focus of this presentation. Specifically, I and Catherine will consider Parmigianino's approach to chiaroscuro woodcut and etching, and for each technique, respectively characterize the qualities of impressions that were executed under his eye. In so doing, we aim to define more clearly Parmigianino's chiaroscuro and etched oeuvre, and to understand better his aesthetic ambitions and intentions in printmaking. Introduced in Italy around 1516, the chiaroscuro woodcut, which involves printing an image from two or more wood two or more wood blocks inked in different shades of a single hue was one of the most successful early forays into color printing in Europe. The term chiaroscuro refers to the modeling of form using light and shadow, and the chiaroscuro woodcut technique creates the illusion of depth through tonal contrasts. Parmigianino's investment in the novel technique was without precedent in Renaissance Italy. Working first with Ugo da Carpi on the Diogenes, and then with Antonio da Trento, Parmigianino collaborated on a total of seven chiaroscuro woodcuts and one mixed technique print, in which he combined etching with tonal woodblocks. Parmigianino not only provided designs for his block cutters, often developing his ideas through multiple stages, but he also appears to have had a hand in conceiving the ink palettes and assumed some role in publishing. In overall scope of production and extent of participation, the involvement of such earlier artists as Titian, Raphael, and Baldessari Peruzzi in the creation of chiaroscuro woodcuts was, by comparison, very limited. Vasari is our primary source of Parmigianino and printmaking, and it is worth summarizing a few of his remarks here. The writer mentions Ugo da Carpi's Diogenes twice in the lives, both in the life of Marcantonio Raimondi and in the life of Parmigianino, praising it as a più bella stampa, a most beautiful print. Vasari is also responsible for identifying Parmigianino's principal chiaroscurist, Antonio da Trento, who did not sign any prints with his full name and lists his four most accomplished prints, the Martyrdom of Two Saints, the Madonna and Child, Augustus and the Tiburtine Sibyl, and this nude man seen from behind. Importantly, Vasari places in Bologna Parmigianino's collaborations with Ugo and Antonio, as well as all his activity as an etcher. 
Diogenes is the only signed and unanimously accepted chiaroscuro by Ugo da Carpi after Parmigianino. The most mature of his 15 securely attributed chiaroscuri, Diogenes represents a technical advancement and stylistic change in Ugo's output. Using four blocks, the image is constructed from interlocking and overlapping areas of color with no single block dominating the design. Early impressions beautifully convey Diogenes' tense musculature, the flow of the luminous drapery, and the distinctive texture of the bird's exposed skin. With its greater reliance on line, Antonio de Trento's block design differs from the more painterly approach of Diogenes. In the main, Antonio's chiaroscuri are composed of two blocks, as you see here in the Augustus and the Tiburtine Sibyl. The, um, on the left is the line block printed alone without the tone block. And you see how um, there, it, dominant, it is a dominant line block that it articulates the majority of the design. And it is the tone block that establishes an overall ground. And then the tone block is cut away to reveal pools and hatchings of white paper, which form the highlights. So those are the reserves of paper. While still comprising strong linear elements, Antonio's only three block chiaroscuro, the martyrdom of two saints, is more complex in the distribution of its designs over the, over the blocks. Again, the line block holds most of the detailed outlines as well as passages of the darkest shadow. The mid block holds both lines and broad planes of color, delineating the background architecture while also lending depth to the figures. The light tone block establishes the ground from which the highlights are cut. And so this is the light tone block. You have the mid block in brown, which delineates the architecture, but also creates these passages of shadow. And then the darkest block is printed in, in black. Although preliminary sketches record the development of Parmigianino's designs, no complete modello for a chiaroscuro is known. By contrast, the occasional final model drawing by his hand does survive for both Coralio's engravings and his own etchings. In the case of the nude man seen from behind, four extant drawings of varied character and in different mediums illustrate Parmigianino's careful planning of the composition. One drawing is a focused figure study. This black and white chalk attentively explores the fall of light across the surface of the man's back. In a second drawing, this one in pen, Parmigianino developed parts of the landscape forest, meticulously rendering a patch of dense foliage at the foot of a tree. Parmigianino ultimately realized a balanced design integrating the graceful nude within the verdant landscape that is softly illuminated from the right. All the evidence points to Parmigianino having drawn his design on the block or having provided a finished drawing for direct transfer. Antonio's line blocks show an extreme fidelity to the ver beautifully varied calligraphic strokes so characteristic of Parmigianino's elegant draftsmanship. Already in the 18th century, Pierre-Jean Mariette eloquently observed, only Parmigianino himself could draw with such liveliness. And there can be scarcely any doubt that he himself drew the lines and the hatching that expressed the dark and the light on the wood before having them cut. Resolving the design for each of the four blocks in the Diogenes or of the three blocks in the martyrdom would have been a staged and iterative process requiring a different kind of instruction from the designer and a greater input from the block cutter. As with the two block prints, Parmigianino's active involvement in the block design process would have made a finished guide unnecessary. Um, would have made a finished guide unnecessary, or perhaps if a modella was produced, it may have been lost through use. For his chiaroscuri, Parmigianino either turned to existing drawings or formulated new ones. In two cases, the Diogenes and the Martyrdom, Parmigianino reprised uh, designs first conceived for Coralio. Accordingly, some have dated the chiaroscuro Diogenes to Parmigianino's Roman years to coincide with the timing of the, drawing, of the drawings for Coralio's engraving, thus dissociating Ugo from, um, 
from Antonio's practice in Bologna. No less an authority than Popham precluded a relationship between Ugo and Antonio in light of the disparity in their respective cutting styles. However, as I shall discuss for the remainder of my presentation, the materials used and the printing procedures followed by both Ugo and Antonio point to a single workshop where supplies and technical knowledge were shared. What is more, a common block publishing history unites the outputs of these two printmakers. Turning first to the printing inks, as the work of Linda Stiber Moranis has shown, a characteristic of the Carrasfuri issued from Parmigianino's shop is the extreme refinement of the inks, both in fabrication and aesthetic conception. The earliest impressions of Diogenes are printed in a narrow chromatic range with the darkest block printed in gray rather than black. By superimposing sheer films of ink that optically blend, Ugo created intermediate tones without using additional blocks. The transitions from block to block are smooth and subtle, enhancing the integrity of the design and the print's painterly qualities. Now to quickly illustrate what I mean by refined printing inks, here I compare the inks in Ugo's Diogenes and um, those in a Chiaroscuro by Niccolo Vicentino after a design by Parma Giannino, uh, the work of Vicentino dating to uh, the 1540s. As you can see on the left, the pigments in Ugo's inks are finely ground, such that you cannot individuate pigment particles. And the inks are laid down in thin, uniform, translucent layers. This is in contrast to Vicentino's inks, in which you see the coarsely ground pigments, which are and the ink layers are applied um, very thickly and in, in, in opaque layers. Like Ugo, Antonio demonstrated a concern for tonal unity, even when printing a two block composition. In order to soften the visual weight of the line, Antonio occasionally printed the darkest block with gray ink. Notably, both Antonio and Ugo used a gray ink comprised of an unusual combination of orpiment mixed with carbon black. Also to further mute contrasts, Antonio occasionally printed a tone block over the line block. And um, here you can see, uh, I need to, here we go. Here you can see how the gray block is where it's printed directly onto the paper. You can see the gray and then the blue uh, tone block has been printed over that line block. Such overprinting can only be successful uh, if the tone block ink is translucent and applied in a thin layer, as is the case here. Perhaps the best illustration of the refinement of ink in Parmigianino's shop is the overlapping of a sheer blue-gray mid-tone block and red ochre light, light tone block to create a brown. So here again, you can see the mid-tone block printed directly onto the paper. And when it is printed over the red, it creates this brown. Such an advanced disposition of colors in the Chiaroscuro woodcut only emerges in Bologna, in the Bologna workshop, doubtless stemming from Parmigianino's command of painting with oils. There's also evidence of shared stocks of paper being used in the Bologna printmaking workshop. For example, a letter N in a circle watermark is found in early impressions of the Diogenes and the martyrdom of two saints. Furthermore, a heart-shaped crossbow with arrow is found in both um, early impressions of the Diogenes and a first state impression of Parmigianino's etching of the entombment, the second version. Uh, the proximity of etching and chiaroscuro in Parmigianino's shop is a point to which Catherine will return. Hugo's activity alongside alongside Antonio in Bologna is further supported by the subsequent shared publishing history of their woodblocks. Much like Parmigianino's etching plates, which went through multiple posthumous campaigns of reworking and printing, Ugo and Antonio's blocks were reprinted through the 16th century. Later printings have traditionally been traced through the study of blocks, that is the accumulation of cracks, losses, and wormholes, as well as the broadening of lines and the consequent loss of details. However, later editions can also be identified through changes in palettes and printing materials. 
Diogenes was posthumously printed in the same shop as Antonio's martyrdom and Augustus in a brown, green, brown, and black palette on paper with a letter F over triple mount watermark. And you see the watermark on the right. These late impressions, likely dating to the final third of the 16th century, not only show blockware, but are printed in the same low grade oily inks. The palette is also aberrant, as you can see the staccato appearance of the darkest block in black against the rest of the composition flattens rather than models the forms in the Diogenes. It is important to note that later printings are much more common than the early impressions issued from Parmigianino's shops, which are quite rare. The prevalence of posthumous impressions has contributed to misattributions and obscured Parmigianino's intentions in printmaking, as will be further elaborated by Catherine with regards to the etchings. Although the precise arrangements are unknown, in addition to supplying designs and advising on inks, Parmigianino must also have assumed some role in publishing prints issued from his Bologna workshop. At least events described by Vasari point to the painter's physical control of their matrices. Vasari recounts that one morning, Antonio broke into the painter's coffer to steal his drawings and his stampe di rame e di legno, that is his copper plates and wood blocks. Parmigianino recovered the printing matrices, but not his drawings. Following these events, Parmigianino abandoned printmaking. The theft may explain how so many drawings Parmigianino produced in these years were later adopted by Niccolò Vicentino's prolific workshop, shaping the next generation of Italian chiaroscurists. The continued reliance on Parmigianino's drawings for chiaroscuro, alongside the reprinting of Ugo and Antonio's blocks into the 17th century, testify to the enduring appreciation for the painter's designs on paper an enthusiasm that was also satisfied by Parmigianino's exquisite etchings. Alongside this impressive body of chiaroscuro woodcuts, Parmigianino executed a small but remarkable group of etchings during his years in Bologna. Most are small in size and show a single figure or a few figures close to the picture plane in a variety of elegant poses. The chiaroscuri and etchings share a number of physical characteristics, forming a network of associations from which emerges a picture of Parmigianino's ambitious printmaking enterprise. He establishes an almost formulaic approach to his printed compositions, repeating and recombining similar motifs such as figures seated on draped perches, plants as framing devices, windswept hair, and the often curious cropped figure. Comparing his etching of the lovers in a landscape with de Trento's nude man seen from behind, for example, or his, sorry. Not. Catherine, if you use the arrows on screen, yep, thank you. Yes, yeah, then that will work better, thank you. Um, or his small youth with two bearded men and de Trento St. John the Baptist show their striking visual analogies. Furthermore, as we shall see, through his use of plate tone, Parmigianino sought to achieve beautiful wash-like effects in his etchings, similar to those created by the translucent layers of tone in his woodcuts. The proximity of Parmigianino's chiaroscuro and etching production is nowhere more evident than in his extraordinary healing of the lame man after Raphael's celebrated design for the Acts of the Apostles tapestry series. In this, his boldest experiment, he unites the two printmaking techniques to produce the first mixed media print of its kind. In the earliest two states of the etch plate, before the reworking, Parmigianino's graceful draftsmanship shines through. His technique is simplified compared to his other prints, more reliant on contour and less densely hatched, since a tone block was intended from the outset to complement the etched parts of the image and introduce the required chiaroscuro effects. Initially, a single gray block was printed on top of the etching. As you can see from this impression in Boston, the gray tone adds richness and spatial definition to the composition. The columns receding into the background now assume their full circular form, for example. 
Parmigianino, an artist who was continuously seeking to perfect his technique, later replaced the single block with two tone blocks to further enhance the modeling and depth of the image. Permitted in a workshop where relief and intaglio press were operating side by side, the healing of the lame man expresses clearly Parmigianino's ambitions for the print medium. Later in Bologna, Guido Reni would similarly operate a rolling press and platen press side by side in his workshop, as documented in the artist's studio inventory, drawn up after his death. The healing is one of 18 etchings presently attributed to Parmigianino. While a chronology of these etchings is difficult to establish, it is possible to identify his earliest and most mature efforts in the medium. Popham was surely right to place the little sleeping Cupid early on in his printmaking career. The figure is taken from Marc Antonio's Massacre of the Innocents after Raphael and appears to be an exercise in imitation down to the precise and tight hatching technique. Parmigianino's delicate etching of an arm, which closely follows the right arm of his figure of Diogenes, also should be viewed as an early trial print by the artist. His two entombments probably represent his more mature work, displaying a total command of various graphic systems and, less, and a less literal definition of form as contours dissolve and the images are built up through more abstract patches of hatching. His entombments also look forward to the finished drawings he produced in Parma, presenting many compositional and graphic analogies with his Pripus and Lotus, David with the head of Goliath and others. Notably, his etchings not only reflect his activities as a draftsman, but equally informed the drawing style of his later years, leading to the more disciplined systems of hatching of some of his pen and ink presentation drawings. For his etchings, as for his woodcuts, Parmigianino either relied on an existing design or one he created specifically for the print medium. For his print of the biblical figure of Judith, a detailed working sequence can be established. He started by executing a meticulous drawing in soft red chalk with white heightening, which is now in the British Museum's collection. This drawing served as the source for a lightly bitten etching, the details and dimensions of which match its drawn model closely. This pale, delicate etching has the appearance of an experimental or trial print, and indeed it is extremely rare. It in turn acted as the model for Parmigianino's well-known final etching of, of Judith that was published. Interestingly, the two Judiths were executed on the opposite sides of the same plate, as revealed by the two prints identical plate marks. On the verso of the matrix, therefore, Parmigianino continued to refine the composition, depicting a tassel on the sack, altering the drapery um, in the background and adding movement to Judith's robe. This final version survives in four states, some posthumous, which testify to the enduring appeal of the image and the desire by later printmakers and publishers to extend the life of Parmigianino's plates for as long as possible. Identifying the states of the etchings is, is immensely instructive, revealing much about Parmigianino's working methods, the function of his prints and their popularity. Well over half of Parmigianino's et etchings exist in between four and seven states, many more than described in the literature. Importantly, tracing the evolution of the plates clears up some of the misconceptions surrounding his etchings, in particular, the appearance of the earliest lifetime impressions and the consistent misattribution of later states to copyists. The first states of Parmigianino's etchings are rare, often surviving in no more than one or two impressions. Parmigianino started by drawing most of the composition in etching, probably following a dry point underdrawing that he had sketched on the plate. The beauty and grace of his draftsmanship is apparent in these early states, as he sketched his designs with ease and fluidity. In the second states, he continued to work up the composition with dry point, refining the details and enhancing the effects of light and shade. During these early stages, he experimented with colored inks and tone, co covering the plate with films of ink, and then selectively wiping away certain areas to reveal patches of highlight. In the Met's impression of the Virgin and Child, for example, printed in brown, Parmigianino wiped the plate clean to create areas of highlight, 
notably on the shoulder, hair, and forehead of Christ and on the Virgin's back, uh, on the Virgin's cheek. So dramatic are these contrasts that at first glance they resemble dabs of white heightening. Similarly, in the beautiful early state of the adoration in Braunschweig, Parmigianino covered the plate with gray tome and wiped away the brightest parts of the composition, mainly the backs, shoulders, and heads of the figures. In this Braunschweig impression, as well as in a comparable one in the British Museum, he wiped the plate by hand rather than with a cloth, leave, leaving traces of fingerprints in the smudgy tone, which you can see up here. These atmospheric early printings in which Parmigianino deploys colored ink, plate tone, and a subtle combination of etching and dry point are true masterpieces of the medium. Late impressions of the early states are often very worn, revealing the extent to which the plates were run through the press before they were re-engraved. Most of Parmigianino's plates were subsequently reworked with the burying by later hands, sometimes several times. Youth and two bearded men, for example, was completely transformed in the hands of later printmakers. In the fourth state, Parmigianino's original etch lines are no longer visible. As you can see here, the faces of the figures are transformed. The lines in the sky have disappeared and have only been re-engraved in part, leaving a blank area above the heads of the figures. These late states are frequently described as copies, but consistent flaws in the copper indicate that they were in fact pulled from Parmigianino's original plates. And here you can see the same uh, tiny flaw in the copper repeated in every state um, at the top of, of each image. As these examples show, the most worn impressions of Parmigianino's prints are not necessarily the latest ones. Furthermore, contrary to usual expectation, the impressions displaying a higher density of lines often constitute the earliest states rather than vice versa. This is because the initial lines Parmigianino executed in dry point and etching quickly wore away, leaving behind the main contours that, repeat, that were repeatedly reinforced with the burin. It is difficult to date the late impressions of Parmigianino's etchings, though subsequent printing campaigns of his plates were probably confined to the 16th century. Water, watermark evidence would help, but the prints are too small to gather enough consistent information. The survival of an extraordinary sheet on which eight of Parmigianino's etchings are printed side by side, and therefore nearly half of his etched oeuvre, reveals that many of his plates stay together and were probably reworked by the same hand, or at least in the same workshop. This sheet shows most of the prints in their last states. Only Judith exists in an even later one. These reworked late impressions, which no longer display Parmigianino's original draftsmanship or subtle atmospheric qualities have little to do with his original intentions. The early impressions we have discussed, printed in color and covered in selectively wiped tone, reveal the extent to which Parmigianino sought to recreate the effects of ink and wash drawings. It is in Bologna, Northern Italy, that a great demand for Parmigianino's drawings emerged among a sophisticated and educated clientele, as noted by Vasari. And it is this demand that undoubtedly provided the main stimulus for Parmigianino's efforts in printmaking. His beautiful atmospheric etchings would have found their place alongside drawings in the collection of local, local amateurs and conoscenti who so admired his work. It should be stressed, however, that these collect collectors were the cultured few, those who came to be known in later centuries as curieux and connoisseurs. The fact that the plates continue to be printed even when very worn and that they were reworked repeatedly testifies to the immense popularity of Parmigianino's little images, which would endure for centuries to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Naoko and Catherine, really, uh, for your presentations, which I really um, have much enjoyed. And um, 
looking at your images, the images you shared, Catherine, makes me um, sad that in fact in the collection here, we don't have uh, early impressions with those beautiful uh, colors that you showed, um, except, uh, uh, except the healing uh, of the lame man, which, um, which in fact, yeah, is partly um, an etching with, uh, with a tone block, but none of the sort of brownish inks that, uh, that you showed. Um, and in fact, I, maybe I'm going just to ask, uh, uh, start with a question uh, related to the etching of uh, the woman seated on, on the ground. And, um, and to ask you, uh, you, you, you wrote about it, but um, uh, just if you want to sort of uh, share again with the audience, um, do you have any thoughts uh, about the relationship between uh, the, the drawing, which is on a much uh, larger scale, uh, and that print, which is actually smaller uh, compared to the drawing, even though they are very much yeah, similar and, uh, and the drawing is quite finished in, in a way. Yes, absolutely. I mean, um, what is clear is that Parmigianino um, arrived in Bologna with a stock of drawings that um, were not necessarily initially made probably with a print in mind, but then he decided to use um, as a model for, for his prints. And this is probably an instance of that. Um, the, the resting woman that's the beautiful drawing that you have in your collection is a different scale. So um, I'm not sure, you know, it wouldn't have used, been used as the direct model, but probably the inspiration. And he likely would have produced an intermediary drawing that um, he would have then traced onto the plate um, and then done a, a, a dry point underdrawing, a, a dry point sketch, and then used that um, as the model for his etching once the varnish was put on the plate. Um, the, 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 the three Judiths that I, that I showed are very instructive because that's the one example where you have the exact same scale. Um, and the intermediary etching um, is identical and it shows that he probably did trace the original drawing um, onto the plate. On the plate. Yeah, exactly. The other drawing that we have, um, which relates directly to an etching, um, is the lovers that's in the, the Albertina. And again, it's not identical for slightly different scale. So in this instance, too, there might have been an intermediary drawing that he would have prepared. Um, no, fascinating. Yeah, I just wanted yeah, to hear uh, again what you thought about that kind of, um, yeah, uh, or not, <laughs> connection between the two. Um, Mary, Mary Vaccaro actually asks, uh, do the watermarks on the paper allow us to localize any production in Parma? And, and the question is addressed to, to you both. To Parma or um, Bologna, you mean? Uh, she wrote Parma, but um, yes, I guess you could talk about, yeah, Bologna yeah. probably, yeah. Yes, um, there is a watermark that um, does place the, the etchings in Bologna. Um, it, there's a specific um, hand with a flower watermark with the initials BF. And um, that is, it's recorded by Picard on a Bolognese document of 1533. So, um, and it's, it's quite a, it's quite a um, particular watermark. There are various, I've worked a lot on Bolognese um, watermarks and, and looked at, um, for example, in the, in the Bodleian, every book that was published in Bologna between about 1525 and 1550. Um, and uh, there is another watermark, which is the head in a circle watermark, which is very specifically Bolognese. And that is also found on, um, late impressions of, of Parmigianino's prints, which makes me think that maybe um, the posthumous impressions might have been printed in Bologna or at least in the area. Um, Thank you. And actually, yes, Mary um, uh, sort of specified, uh, clarified her question. She meant uh, later production in Parma. So it, uh, do any, do the watermarks actually uh, help us um, addressing the question of printmaking in, in Parma uh, for Parmigianino? Well, it seems um, that Parmigianino's printmaking activities stopped in Bologna. Um, there's very little evidence that he continued to make prints in, in Parma. 
Um, and then Ariella asks, um, do you think that Parmigino actually had two presses in, a, in his workshops? Is there any sense of where in Bologna this workshop might have been and who else might have been involved in it? Now, Co, do you want to or, should, or shall I? <laughs> well, I mean, it would be great to know exactly under which portico, you know, Parmigianino had his shop, but I don't yeah. think we have it. <laughs> we don't have that information. Um, just with regards to elaborate on the issue of the two presses, Catherine mentioned um, the kind of later documented uh, example of a painter who um, had two presses. Um, that was the case of Guido Reni in Bologna in his 1642 inventory, it records um, two printing presses and they're, they're generically described as um, one printing press and another smaller one. But the implication of course is that he would have been running a, uh, a plan press and an intaglio press. And there's a, you know, there's a strong parallel to be drawn as well in the case of uh, Guido Reni and Parmigianino in terms of their investment in printmaking. Guido was, of course, uh, an etcher, quite, and, but also collaborated very closely in Care Spirit Woodcut with Bartolomeo Coriolano. And in many respects, it was this revival that takes place, um, you know, in the 1630s. Uh, in the hands of, of Guido Reni and, and Coriolano, I think, very consciously looking back at the example of Parmigianino because the technique largely falls out of favor, out of fashion by the end of, of the 16th century. So to take it up again, I, I think, you know, Guido Reni must have been looking back at this. And, and there was a very similar kind of um, collaborative relationship between um, the painter and the block cutter. In fact, it was Coriolano who was a witness to that uh, inventory that was that was drawn up um, at, uh, in 1642. So I, I I feel like you know looking at the evidence of the prints and and what I you know certainly in the case of the etchings um, that are wiped um, that would have required you know Parmigianino's direct hand. And in the case of the Karaskir woodcut, I feel that, you know, all of this evidence of this kind of extreme sophistication of the printing inks and, and more than just the formulation of the inks, but the conception of color, of, of how you optically blend these different colors, it, it never occurs, um, you know, elsewhere in, in 16th century um, Italian Karaskir woodcuts that I feel that Parmigianino must have been directly involved um, in, in, the, in the printing itself. And also because you see a huge qualitative gap um, in the later printings, which suggests to me that even a very um, accomplished printer was not able to emulate the, the refinement of Parmigianino's impressions. Yeah. Thank you. Um, one last question from um, Alessandra Talignani, who asks um, whether these prints, um, etching or woodcuts, were um, original inventions or whether there are actually some which have been derived from his paintings or um, details from, from his paintings. So for, with, for the etchings, they, um, so we have 18 of them. Two of them are not his own invention. Um, so you have the little sleeping Cupid that is after um, the Massacre of the Innocents um, uh, print by Marc Antonio Ramondi after Raphael. And then of course you have the healing of the lame man um, after one of the scenes in the Acts of the Apostles tapestry series. The rest of the prints um, can be related to drawings, but um, not uh, to paintings. So yes, they were principally inventions made for yeah for the print yeah. uh, for the print. Mm. Yeah. And um, and now, what about you? What um, what about the chiaroscuri? They they are you know they're not um, they they were not intended to circulate. Um, painted compositions in the way that, you know, you have examples of that um, elsewhere. Um, they, they were very much, as Catherine pointed out, you know, responding to this taste um, 
for for his drawings, I think. Um, and in and so in that regard, they're very much capturing these inventions on the scale um, on on the scale of of um, on the uh, on the scale of drawings, really. Although, of course, there you know there are sources, there are you know designs, parts of designs that are echoed throughout his paintings. It's not that he's dealing with completely different subject matter. Of course, it's all of a piece, but there isn't that kind of um, like I said, uh, an effort to record an entire. Um, painted composition in any of his prints. Which is interesting um, when you look at uh, Raimondi with Raphael, whereas uh, there, there was a little bit more of an attempt to, um, yeah, to, to have his sort of painted compositions being more known through, through prints. Um, whereas Parmigianino you know, clearly for him printmaking was, yeah, as you say, coming from a different uh, perspective and with a different uh, um, outcome. Um, Terribly interesting. Well, um, we are coming now to five to five here in London. And um, since there are no more questions in the chat, uh, I would suggest we now break for 15 minutes. Um, and so we reconvene at uh, 10 past uh, five for the last two papers and then uh, yeah, questions after those papers. So thank you very much uh, for the speakers up until now and see you in a little bit. Hello, everyone. I'm pleased to, to welcome you back uh, this afternoon. And um, for the, what, yeah, the last two uh, papers uh, of the afternoon. And I'm pleased to, to introduce uh, the next speaker, who is uh, Dr. Akim uh, Nan, uh, who is a senior lecturer and uh, curator of Italian art from the 15th to the 19th century at the Albertina Museum in Vienna. Uh, Akim is author of several books and exhibition catalogues on Renaissance artists, including Raphael, The Drawings, very uh, successful exhibition uh, in 2017, which he, which he organized in collaboration uh, with the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford and its curator, Catherine Whistler. And, and also um, what, yeah, um, the main reason why he's with us uh, today is also the author of the Catalogue Raisonne of Parmigianino Drawings, which was published in 2007. And um, we would like also to remind uh, actually that his most recent book is on Rembrandt and his landscape drawings, which was just published last year in 2021. And, and today Akim is going to uh, talk uh, about uh, a few works in the Albertina collection uh, and on the scholarship actually that, uh, um, that was published on um, Parmigianino drawings in general and in particular on some of the works uh, in, at the Albertina. So thank you Akim and over to you. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. Um, you have asked me to speak about the, <clears throat> the Viennese drawings of Parmigianino, and so I have tried to <clears throat> make an overview. So I have to look. Um, <clears throat> Parmigianino's art is particularly well represented in Vienna. The Albertina owns a significant collection of his drawings and etching, etchings as well as prints based on his designs. And the Kunsthistorisches Museum houses no fewer than six of the artist's paintings, including the famous self-portrait in a convex mirror and the bow carving Cupid. It was also Vienna's art historians who contributed significantly to the study of the artist's works. <clears throat> in 1921, the first fundamental monograph by Lili Fröhlich Bohm Parmigianino and the Manierismus was published in Vienna. The text was written during the war years 1911 to 1914, which made the work very difficult in terms of access to the works and obtaining illustrative material. The book was not simply a monograph, but was much more ambitious in scope. The author examined Parmigianino's importance for mannerisms, mannerism, and included not only artists such as Saviati, Bronzino, Pontormo, Cellini, 
or Jambologna, but also traced his impact on the school of Fontainebleau, Nuremberg arts and crafts, and the painters of Emperor Rudolf II's circle. However, many of Parmigianino's work were still unknown to the author at the time. <clears throat> Another important figure was Johannes Wilde, a native of Hungary who studied art history in Vienna from 1915 to 1918. Wilde later worked at the Kunsthistorisches Museum and emigrated to London in 1939 because his wife was Jewish, thanks to the help of Count Antoine Seelen. He worked on the pictures of Count Seelen and later on Michelangelo's drawings for Ho's for his re-evaluation, he became dec decisively responsible. In 1918, Wilde received his doctorate in Vienna with the dissertation, Die Anfänge der Italienischen Radierung, in which he elaborated for the first time the essential stylistic features of Parmigianino's art, the grace, elegance, and beauty of his figures with their elongated limbs, nervous, agitation <clears throat> and complicated ponderation. The development of Parmigianino's etching technique from a painterly free open style to a closed line technique approaching copper plate engraving as described by Wilde is still valid today. Another scholar working in Vienna, the later director of the Albertina Konrad Oberhuber was largely responsible for the redefinition of Parmigianino's drawings from the 1960s onwards. Finally, in 2003, to commemorate the 500th anniversary of the artist's birth, Vienna hosted the only major survey exhibition entitled Parmigianino und der Europäische Manierismus, curated by Lucia Fornaris Chianchi, and Silvia Ferino Facten. In addition, I would like to refer to my two volume complete catalog of Parmigianino drawings published in 2007, which I submitted as a <clears throat> habilitation thesis at the University of Vienna. <clears throat> in the Albertina, there are 32 sheets by Parmigianino that can be regarded as his own work. Three sheets are double-sided so that we can speak of 35 drawings. <clears throat> they come from all the artist's creative periods, including the depiction of a Sacra Conversazione in red chalk, the oldest surviving sketch for an altarpiece, or the preparatory drawing for the Madonna and Child in the Courted Institute galleries. Most of the drawings were in the possession of the founder of the Albertina, Duke Albert of Saxon Teschen, and can be traced back to such important collections as those of Thomas Howard, Earl of Arundel, Sir Peter Lilly, Prosper Langkring, Pierre Crozat, Pierre Jean Mariette, Marquis de Lagois, Julien de Parme, Prince de Ligne. Antonio Maria Zanetti, Moritz von Fries, <clears throat> Gottfried Winkler, and others. The famous self-portrait can be traced back to Giorgio Vasari, who used it for the artist's portrait in woodcut in the second edition of the Vita of 1568. Compared to the 35 drawings now accepted as his own, the Albertina's old inventory listed many more, 69 sheets in all. However, 42 of these are no longer, no longer considered originals today. The rich holdings listed in the inventory were not adequately appreciated in later times and were drastically reduced. This extreme reduction, which began in the late 19th century and saw the number of Parmigianino, Parmigianino drawings in the Albertina approached zero, lasted for 70 years 
and led to a long lasting misjudgment of the artistic's graphic work. Of the artist's graphic work. The Austrian art historian Franz Wickhoff, who edited the catalog of the Albertina's Italian drawings in 1891-1892, accepted only three drawings as his own. Three others, which he considered to be originals, were not by the artist. To the other drawings, he wrote comments such as, in the manner of Parmigianino, distantly related to Parmigianino, <clears throat> or after a composition by Parmigianino. After all, he attributed to him the study for the head of the Christ child in the Hieronymus vision, which was considered a work by Correggio in the old inventory. In her monograph of 1922, Lili Fröhlich Bum listed only two drawings from the Albertina. Among them, however, were studies for a Pentecost scene, which were attributed to Dosso Dossi in the old inventory. As early as 1915, Lili Fröhlich Bum had published a study entitled Handzeichnungen des Parmigianino zu einigen seiner bekanntesten Gemälde, in which she mentions only one drawing of the Albertina, the Madonna for the uh, study for the Madonna in the Hieronymus vision. However, she, she strangely excluded this sheet as a copy in her later monograph. Giovanni Copertini accepted only two drawings as originals in his two volume monograph of 1932, one of which is by Battista Franco. Armando Ottavio Quintavalle in his book Il Parmigianino published in 1948 cited only one drawing from the Albertina. However, it would have to be clarified whether Copertini or Quintavalle ever visited the Albertina collection. In the 1941 collection catalog of Albertina drawings entitled Die Schulen von Ferrara, Bologna, Parma und Modena, der Lombardei, Genuas, Neapels und Siziliens, <coughs> Stix and Spitzmüller list only one drawing, the head of the Christ child. Three others, which they consider to be originals by Parmigianino, are by Perino del Vaga. Sidney Friedberg, in his admirable and exemplary, exemplary 1950s book, Parmigianino's, Parmigianino, his works in painting, did not catalog the drawings and only mention studies associated with paintings. It is to the British art historian Arthur Popham's credit that he was the first to write a systematic account of Parmigianino <clears throat> as a draftsman. In his book, The Drawings of Parmigianino, published in London in 1953, the clarity and precision of the language and the wealth of material presented by Parmigianino's presented, presented put Parmigianino's importance into perspective. At the time, Popham estimated the number of surviving sheets at about 500. Today, we assume twice that number. However, since there had been no critical research at the Albertina for so long, and Popham had never been back to Vienna since the war, there is not a single illustration of an Albertina drawing in the book. In the text, he only mentions Parmigianino's self-portrait and another drawing which is today considered a copy. Konrad Oberhuber deserves the credit for being the first to systematically examine the Albertina drawings, for researching them with an expert eye and for attributing to the artist, again, almost all the drawings that we now regard as his own. In his 1963 Albertina exhibition catalog, he not only discussed all the artist's drawings, 
but also examine the etchings as well as the engravings and the chiaroscuro woodcuts based on his inventions, as well as Parmigianino's effect on the artists of his circle up to Primaticcio and Niccolò dell'Abate. Um, Oberhofer also came to new conclusions about the chiaroscuro woodcuts and the etchings. For the first time, he attributed both versions of the entombment of Christ to Parmigianino. Adam Bach had regarded the first version, uh, the left one, as a work by Guido Reni. Zani, on the other hand, attributed the first version to Parmigianino after identifying another sheet as an original by Reni. Zani and others, however, rejected the second version, the, the right one as a copy, which until then had been considered a major work by Parmigianino. Um, <clears throat> so Oberhofer was the first to accept both of them uh, as works by Parmigianino. And in my view, they are executed in the Roman and not in the Bolognese period. In an essay published shortly afterwards, Oberhuber, like Johannes Wilde, before him, excluded the etching Peter and John healing the sick at the temple gate after Raphael from Parmigianino's oeuvre. In my, my view, they are right in this excluding uh, this print. In a letter, Oberhuber communicated his list of newly determined drawings to Arthur Popham, who on the basis of better photographs, now accepted all attributions with a few exceptions. Thus, the Albertina drawings discussed by Oberhuber are almost all included in Arthur Popham's, Popham's large three volume complete catalog of Parmigianino's drawings published in 1971. The only drawing that escaped Popham's attention <clears throat> was that of a satyr with a sprig of grapes to the right, which was not purchased by the, purchased by the Albertina until 1965. It was once connected on a single sheet with the standing nude of a youth in dorsal view, which is in the Städel in Frankfurt uh, to the left. Since then, there have been only a few additions to the Albertina's Parmigianino holdings. In 1974, Oberhuber realized that a pen and ink drawing with wash and in different colors was not by Girolamo Mozzolo or Bedoli, but an early sketch for the Madonna del Cololungo in the Uffizi. Also attributed to Bedoli since Popham was the red chalk drawing with the studies for the portrait of St. Thomas Aquinas in the Brera. Gustavo Frizzoni <clears throat> had identified the, the oil portrait of the famous Dominican scholar as a work by Bedoli in 1884. And so it seemed only logical to identify him as the author of the red chalk drawing as well. However, the fineness and precision of the lines, the clarity in the rendering of the material speak for Parmigianino as the draftsman. The strokes give the impression that the sleeve can be grasped and wraps itself around the hand. In Bedoli's drawings, on the other hand, the stroke is more uniform. The lines are evenly distributed, do not lead into death, and are limited solely to modeling the surface. In the drawing style, <clears throat> there are close references to sheets, to Parmigianino's sheets from the late Parma period, such as the study for Eve on the vault of the choir of Santa Maria della Steccata. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the drawing is a little bit um, falsificated because of the gray layer uh, in the background, which is a later addition by another hand. 
The same is true of the Brera portrait. Uh, sorry, this is now, yes, the same is true of the, no, sorry, I have to go back. The correctness of the traditional attribution of the sheet to Parmigianino is also supported by the uncovered drawing on the reverse, which can be connected to the virgins on the wall of the Steccata. The same is true for the, of the Brera portrait. With his, final facial feature, with his fine fa facial features, the saint wonderfully reveals a perceptive, through-minded character. Such a sensitive, psychologizing rendering is not found in portraits by Bedoli. The movement is full of self-determination and the spontaneous turn toward the cross is underlined by the sweep that runs through the figure. Through the, through the rotation of the upper body and the different position of the arms, the swing is also articulated in its spatial dimension. In Girolamo Mazzola Bedoli's work, on the other hand, the movements are less controlled. His ecstatically moving, seemingly jolted figures are filled with a pathos that is supposed to express emotion, but is purely external, not reflecting any real inner, inner sympathy. The limbs are characterized by an unnatural elasticity, even arbitrary pliancy, and thus lack the flowing energy that always animates Parmigianino's creatures from within. In my view, therefore, the painting is also by Parmigianino's hand. The same may be true of the magnificent portrait of a scholar attributed to Bedeli in a London private collection, which Konrad Oberhuber pointed out to me. Indeed, references to other portraits by Parmigianino emerge in the monumental posture, the strength and willpower of the sitter, and the careful, careful elaboration of the details. Unfortunately, I only know a black and white photograph of the portrait, and so the task of closely examining the original has yet to be undertaken. It would not be the first time that the great art historian Konrad Oberhuber, who sadly died far too early in 2007, had been right in his judgment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Akim. Um, considering, yes, it's 5.30, perhaps I'll ask Amy uh, to actually um, do her, to give her presentation, to give her talk now, and then we'll hold questions at the end, both for Akim and for Amy, if you don't mind, if that's okay with, uh, with you both. So I'm going to introduce uh, Amy, who is curator um, at the Frick Collection in New York, a specialist in Italian Renaissance. Uh, she has organized exhibitions on Bertoldo di Giovanni, Giovanni Battista Moroni, and um, European portrait medals from the 50th to the 19th century, Andrea del Sarto, and also on Parmigianino. She has held curatorial and academic positions at the Morgan Library and Museum, where she was a postdoctoral fellow at the Morgan Drawing Institute in 2014, and at Columbia University, where she earned her PhD. And today, Amy is going to talk about Parmigianino and the art of reversal, etching, drawing, and invention, explores the artist's experiments with reversal in his drawings and prints. So thank you, Amy, and uh, looking forward to hearing your, your talk. Thank you, Cathy, and thanks to you and Guido for the invitation to speak today. And congratulations to both of you and your whole team for getting together this exhibition and the publication. And doing that during these years is quite a feat. Um, it's an honor to be among this group of esteemed scholars, and I've benefited from all of the panelists' work in so many ways. Um, and if I may, just for those of you who are still on this call in its third hour, I want to commend the Zoom endurance of the participants. Thank you very much for staying on. Um, this talk derives from an essay published some years 
years ago in a volume dedicated to the late Professor David McTavish, um, and it's been a treat to revisit this material. So I have to admit that in the wake of the last two years and a half and the enormity of the struggles endured the world over, obviously the pandemic, fights for social justice, war, prime among them, it can sometimes feel trivial uh, to wonder, for example, about the attribution of a Renaissance drawing, or it can feel a little indulgent to dive deeply into the individual pen marks through which an artist in the 16th century eventually developed the leg of a saint for a painting. And this is a detail of a um, sheet by Parmigianino in Besançon studying the leg of Saint Rock. Um, but as I return to the material at the heart of this paper, the almost unbearable state of today's world gave me some renewed appreciation for the context in which Parmigianino was working when he produced drawings like this one. Uh, and this drawing was for his altarpiece of Saint Rock, um, still today in Bologna San Petronio. Now, what brought him to Bologna in the first place was, of course, war, the sack of Rome of uh, 1527. Art played a role in this artist's experience of war. And the famous tale is that he was interrupted by the invading soldiers while he was painting his vision of St. Jerome, uh, sorry, his vision of St. Jerome, but on account of the painting's great beauty, um, the soldiers allowed him to continue. Um, but Vizzari also recounts that um, after this, he was forced to make for those soldiers an infinite number of drawings in pen and wash uh, to pay his ransom, basically art as a matter of life or death. And I've always wondered what he drew for them. Were they religious pictures, erotica? Um, none of those, of course, uh, have been identified among his surviving drawings. Um, his first major painting in Bologna was probably this altarpiece devoted to Saint Rock, uh, the plague saint. I don't know why it's not going forward. Okay. Uh, you can see the dark plague sore on the upper thigh. And plague swept through much of Italy in these years. According to one source, it killed some 12,000 people in Bologna in 1527, 28 hostels, for example, that were previously dedicated to housing pilgrims in Bologna were converted into orphanages for the thousands of children left without their families in the wake of the plague. So this long preamble is, is not to make reductive parallels between then and now comparing tragedy and tragedy, but just to say that then as now, art plays a role during times of human struggle. And that at least to me, it's humbling to think about the human being holding the pen and the paintbrush who made drawings like this and paintings like this. So in the midst of the difficulties of these years, this artist immersed himself perhaps by necessity, perhaps um, as a privilege in art making. So studying in drawings like this, the precise turn of a toe or the angle of a knee that would best express the body of a healed saint. Uh, this paper is centered on works like this drawing for the St. Rock Altarpiece and looks specifically at their relationship to his activities in printmaking um, around this time. And after Parmigianino's flight from Rome, he was sent by his uncle to his native Parma, but ended up in Bologna, where, according to Vizzari, and we've already heard about this today in a, in a wonderful co-presented uh, paper, he became deeply involved in printmaking, putting off painting uh, to some degree to working with engravers and woodblock printers and making his own prints. And I, I wanted to show a, a print that is in the Courtauld exhibition um, after the drawing that has already been seen also in the exhibition. So as a result of this activity, Parmigianino's place as a sort of father of etching in Italy has become well-established, even if he was not the first Italian to practice the technique. And so probably first learned to work with acids from Marcantonio Raimondi, either in Rome or Bologna, where both seem to have fled after the sack of Rome. It's long been said that inscribing on an etching plate resembles the act of drawing itself. So that ease of applying a stylus to a prepared plate, scratching away the wax or resin coating to reveal the metal underneath, being similar in some ways to the act of putting pen to paper. And Parmigianino's talents as a draftsman were well suited to different types of printmaking. His drawing styles varied and could imitate or be made more conducive to translation 
into engraving, woodcut, and etching. So on the left, the drawing seems uh, to be more aligned with or anticipate chiaroscuro woodcut, even if he does ultimately make uh, etching after it or drawings like the Marriage of the Virgin and Chatsworth uh, that lend themselves better to translation into engraving. And that's Caraglio's engraving after it on the right. In this paper, I'd like to consider not just how his drawings imitate or anticipate different kinds of printmaking, but also how his experience in printmaking and in particular in etching informed his drawing practice. Um, sure, he could alter his drawing methods uh, to better suit different kinds of prints, but could the effect of printmaking on his drawings extend beyond just handling of light and uh, of line and modeling, beyond anticipating translation into engraving or woodblock? Might the processes and cognitive processes of printmaking have had an effect on his methods of design and invention otherwise? And I'll consider these questions by taking a look at a selection of Parmigianino's drawings in which he uses reversal as a tool of design. And this selection represents a very small fraction of his enormous output of drawings. And I'm probably talking about some seven sheets in total. Um, and the thousand or so drawings that are um, attributed to him today are themselves a fraction of his total output. So while I don't want to overstate these methods in his overall practice, I think it's worth thinking about how these experiments in print may have enriched his practice as a draftsman. So the earliest um, of my selection is this large-ish sheet, about 19 by 31 centimeters in the Biblioteca Nacional in Madrid, produced around 1522 for the now lost altarpiece um, of the Madonna and Child uh, with Saint Jerome and Blessed Bernardino da Feltre. And I'm showing on the right uh, an engraving by Giulio Bonassone after the altarpiece or a version of it. Um, in the drawing, which I'll make larger, the figure of Saint Jerome appears twice on both sides of the Virgin and Child. And the figure of Bernardino da Feltre does not appear at all. So Parmigianino appears to have first drawn in red chalk the Jerome on the right, folded the paper in half, and created an offset, a counterproof of sorts of the saint on the left, which he then worked up with ink with adjustments to the pose and attributes. Uh, for example, the crucifix goes from pointing out uh, on the right hand figure to pointing inward on the left figure and his face begins on the right looking at the crucifix to on the left looking pensively down to the ground. These are small but significant iconographic adjustments that he could compare side by side in reverse, though doing it this way makes it impossible to include the figure of Blessed Bernardino da Feltre. And according to Bonassone's print, it seems that Parmigianino combined elements explored in the two versions of the saint explored on this sheet. So in the final painting, St. Jerome looks pensively down to the ground while pointing the crucifix outward from his body. So the artist takes elements from both figures that he had experimented with in his drawing. So clearly at this stage in 1522, Parmigianino was already interested in reversal as a means of invention and experimentation. The next example is a sheet in the British Museum related to the so-called vision of St. Jerome, one of some two dozen drawings associated with the painting that survived. And like in the Madrid sheet, here the artist applied different media on a single sheet of paper, but in this case he did so on opposite faces of the sheet. So on the recto, pen and ink and wash over red chalk, and on the verso, red chalk, and it's a little bit more faint. Both sides study the same configuration of the Virgin and Child above with the figures of St. John the Baptist and Jerome below, retaining significantly the same orientation. So the Christ child is on the Virgin's right. Uh, St. John the Baptist is on the left. Uh, and so you can see a little bit on the right side that the ink from the other side is bleeding through the paper. So at the top, there's a sort of double imaging of the Christ child sort of flanking the Virgin on either side. And this is of course an effect that has been exacerbated over time. So in some ways, the recto and verso drawings seem to operate autonomously. They could very well have been drawn on two totally separate sheets of paper. And in a sense that would have been easier to compare the two drawings side by side. And I don't need to belabor the point um, that what I'm showing you on this screen uh, is impossible to do in real life, showing the recto and verso of a single sheet side by side. Uh, but close examination confirms that one drawing does connect 
to the other. So elements of the ink drawing, like the right foot of the Virgin, the outer contour of her leg, appear through the paper on the other side at almost exactly the same points where the chalk drawing establishes the same foot and the outer contour of the other leg. So it seems that there may be, uh, the recto drawing offered a sort of anchor for the artist who flipping the paper over could explore alternative possibilities for the, for the composition through consulting the earlier drawing through the paper in mirror image. And he makes very small adjustments. He raises the head of the Virgin slightly higher on the right, um, and he moves the Christ child slightly lower. And in the painting, um, that child will be pushed even more down. So that beginning of the action, uh, moving the child down is uh, more exaggerated, of course, in the painting. Um, below the Baptist raises both arms to almost encircle the Virgin's feet on the left, but on the right where you can see the ghost of the Baptist's hand sort of reaching around the Virgin's feet. Um, in the chalk drawing on the right-hand side, um, he raises just one hand pointing up and thereby setting up the tension in the final painting in which the Baptist does not penetrate um, the upper stratum of the Virgin's part of the composition, but just sort of retains and is restrained in the lower level of his earthly wilderness. Something changes uh, in the next group of drawings, which were made after he fled Rome for Bologna and after working exclusively with printmaking for some time, or as is believed, he accepted a commission for the St. Rock altarpiece. And in this next set of drawings he makes for that altarpiece, uh, he continues to play with the recto and verso of a single sheet of paper, but with an important distinction from the Roman drawing. On the left is a sheet at the Louvre, on the right, the drawing in Besançon. Whereas the drawing for the vision of St. Jerome retained that single orientation, so the Christ remaining on the right side of the Virgin. For these St. Rock studies, when he flips the paper over, he also flips the composition to follow, indeed to trace through the design on the other side. So these are the other sides of the drawings. The figures are reversed. These drawings are cumulative so that the first drawing becomes through the paper, a point of departure for the second. He experiments with different poses and gestures, some bold, some subtle. And here, for example, in the Besançon sheet, he tried positioning the saint's back leg behind him. And on the right, um, that third leg at far right is actually bleeding through the paper from the other side. Then he swings that back leg forward in a dramatic shift in pose and then scrutinizes the front leg. Um, so that he changes the angle just very slightly, moving the shin just millimeters and elongating that whole leg from knee to toe to refine the expression of that leg. And in the painting, uh, that saint's leg becomes even more vertical. In the Louvre sheet, he plays with the expressive potential, especially of that front leg. He may have begun on the left, which features more searching lines compared uh, to the other side on the right, which features broad sweeps of brush that evoke a sense of freedom, like pushing boundaries of anatomy and expression. So the designations of recto and verso, as is well known, can sometimes be arbitrary to refer to the primary or more significant side of a sheet um, as decided by the owning institution. Um, and for me, the drawing on the right has a sense of exaggerating the other side. Uh, and for this reason, appears to me to be the second of the two. Um, it also features details that will complete the final composition, like the crucifix seen in the upper left corner and the right side drawing, um, and the dog at lower left, just below the elbow of St. Rock. Again, we're talking about the, the, the right side drawing. Um, meanwhile, the left side drawing includes the saint's billowing mantle that will also make it into the final painting. So the artist evidently could pick and choose among the elements explored in these drawings and may well have returned to the drawings multiple times to refine, to add to them, flipping them back and forth. So the painting ultimately retains something of the standing figure of the Besançon sheet, um, but the spirit of the Louvre figure, I think, infuses it with this radical, effusive, almost euphoric character. To be sure, the artist worked on both sides of sheets of paper in different ways throughout his career, often with one side having absolutely nothing to do with the other. 
but he seems to have struck on something in the St. Rock project. And he applied the same cumulative approach to both sides of the sheet, working in reverse, also for his project for the Madonna of the Long Neck. Um, and this is the recto and verso um, of one of two sheets related to the project on which he worked like this on both sides, tracing through both sheets in private collections. The other drawing, which I'm not showing you, traces through just the baby. And here is another example of a lady carrying a child, the Museum of Fine Arts in Budapest. And in the Courtauld exhibition, um, you'll see another related to the staccata ceiling decorations. And here he switches the gestures of the arms. All of these drawings rely on the properties of the properties of paper to transmit an image from one face to the other, and on Parmi Giannino's ability to take these as a point of departure, to draw, to imagine alternative possibilities, further developments of a figure in reverse. It's almost as if for every drawing, the transmission of it through to the other side of the paper becomes a multiple of it, um, a reproduction of it to play with in reverse. His experiments with etching surely developed his activity to work in reverse and his two versions of the entombment etching in which he reworked the entire composition in the other direction serve as one testament to his skill in reversal. Um, and I don't wanna to be too literal in comparing the processes, um, but one might think of moments in the etching process uh, to compare to the way he treats these traced through double-sided drawings. Um, for example, producing a second state or any further state uh, requires returning to the etching plate to make adjustments to the composition, inventing in reverse to what he ultimately wants to print. One might also think of marking up uh, printed proofs as well. Um, in his traced through drawings, might his experience with reproducible printmaking techniques have enriched these processes of design. So I'll close this brief survey with two points. Presumably, Parmigianino used methods like placing the sheet of paper on a glass or glass pane or window, allowing light to, to transmit designs through paper. And Leonardo and Durer both describe using a glass pane for their experiments in perspective. And it's no surprise that these two artists as well, Leonardo and Durer, also made traced through drawings, which leads to my next point. Parmigianino was obviously not the first artist to trace through drawings from one side of a sheet to the other. Uh, Leonardo left just a handful of examples that function in different ways. And of course, Leonardo is a master of reversal, we know from his handwriting. Um, and in some of these, he, he does them in different ways, cleaning up proportions of a face using two different grids on the recto and the verso, um, cleaning up uh, some overworked compositions like the Madonna of the Cat, uh, left that sort of lower section of the figural group becomes muddled and he turns over the sheet and sort of clarifies by picking out um, the outlines that he wants to retain with some further articulation and elaboration. Durer left a much larger number of traced through sheets, around 100, um, which center on meticulous geometry. You can see the proportions um, calculated on the left side here as the foundation for the design on the other side of the sheet, which is clarified, traced through on the other side. And I'll just mention a few surviving sheets by Correggio, this one in Rotterdam, show this interest in picking out contours, clarifying line uh, by tracing through on the other side. Comparing Parmi Giannino's trace through drawings with these, which I've obviously generalized in this short amount of time, one might emphasize the distinction in Parmi Giannino's drawings in which he's testing out options, not quite clarifying, but rather experimenting further, pushing boundaries again of anatomy and expression, creating a range of options from which he can pick and choose elements for a further developed composition. The great number of uh, surviving traced through drawings by Durer, um, again, about a hundred sheets uh, like the one on the left, may also reflect the association between this fluency and exploitation of reversal with active printmakers like Durer, whose activities as a printmaker far outweighed Parmigianino's. And Durer's controlled invention in his sheets anticipates the more rigid techniques of engraving and woodcut while Parmigianino's handling is, in comparison, is much more aligned with etching. 
And as one considers the implications of flipping a composition almost arbitrarily, so Saint Rock looks left and then he looks right, meaning though that the miraculous vision of the crucifix changes sides too, one might wonder about the implications of such arbitrariness, the suspension of the significance of destra and sinistra, the privileged right um, and secondary left side in his religious pictures. How much was the artist committed to orientation of his final product? And in compositions like these, did flipping from one side to the other in the design process have bearing on his selection of a final orientation for his ultimate painting? While I'm suggesting um, that Parmigianino's pioneering foray into etching processes may have accelerated his fluency in drawing in both directions, and in particular, this kind of cumulative drawing through a single sheet of paper, I will underline that these kinds of mirror image inventions, um, that, that this interest in reversal was clear enough from an early age. Um, and it's no surprise that these mirror image inventions would emerge from the hand of an artist uh, whose most famous self-portrait studies himself and the act of reversal in a deeply personal way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Amy. That was, um, and Akim, uh, really fascinating. I'm particularly interested actually in uh, tracing through drawings because I've been working recently, um, not only on Parmigianino, um, and we have seen uh, that, but also on um, fusely, so talking about actually a later artist, and um, and he does it so often in his drawings, and really just um, not in preparation for prints, but out of uh, really just the pleasure of drawing and and, and the sort of ideas that can come out by uh, simple reversal and changes on the other side. It's um yeah, it's quite um, yeah interesting how uh, this lasts on uh, beyond uh, beyond the Renaissance. Um, I'm going to read, uh, yeah, um, there is a question for Akim saying, uh, you spoke about attribution and reattribution at, as at times a highly fluid, fluid state. Do you anticipate that reassessment will continue as a scholarship refocuses and or more possible drawings come to light? Um, <clears throat> maybe I don't understand <clears throat> completely the question. I think um, this extreme reduction in, on the Albertina sheets uh, was, was an exceptional state, which would be interesting to compare to other collections as the, the British Museum or the Louvre. <clears throat> and I think that the reduction was in this case in the other collections more or less the same. I think that what we accept now in the different collections is quite firm. And there will, beside of doubts of one or two sheets maybe that are shifting between Parmigianino and Bedoli or so, but I think the, the, the actual attributions are firm and they won't be reduced anymore. For the enlargement, I don't understand what you what you meant. Sorry. Well, um, the question was yes. Um, the scholarship, of course, will advance and refocus, and more, and maybe yeah, more drawings will come to light, and so there will be inevitably. I would have thought, yeah, a reassessment, not major as you indicate, but uh, something for for sure. Um, Grant Grant Lewis. Um, it's actually not a question, but just uh, a clarification. Um, he says, just to elaborate slightly on the British Museum Jer Saint Jerome drawing, the verso, um, the Baptist is informed by the recto uh, Jerome, who is directly underneath, as much as the recto Baptist. Parmigianino pulls ideas from both saints, real springboard for further ideas, which I think, yeah, it's more or less what, um, what we've seen. And um, Mary Vaccaro, uh, addressing to you, Amy says, I'm glad to see your show that you showed the Rotterdam sheet. And not to take away from your argument, I do think that from his youth, Parmigianino studied Correggio drawings carefully. Agreed. And if I might add, um, that was a drawing from what I what I from what I can, can recollect. Um, the the other side of it was relatively recently uh, rediscovered, and so mm. 
you know, there is, I'm sure this is a shifting landscape, not to relate this to the first question to Akim, but as drawings are further studied, taken off uh, historic mounts, new evidences mm. can also contribute to these understandings. And in fact, um, uh, for those who will have yeah, uh, the chance to look at the catalog that we just um, uh, printed to accompany the drawings gallery display of our uh, Parmigianino works, we were able to add, for example, two new drawings, which unfortunately we can't see um, in the naked eye, but uh, through infrared lights, we were able to add these two new uh, drawings, which uh, actually come to um, uh, they are quite comparable to existing drawings. And so in that case, we are definitely not reversing <laughs> the history of the knowledge of the Parvigianino, but we are definitely uh, adding a little bit more uh, about what we know or, or to the number of works that are known by, by him. Um, Raymond Carlson says, um, he has a question for you, Amy. Your analysis of drawing as a tool of reversal raised for me the question of other tools with this function. To what extent could the use of a mirror or other items in the studio have impacted engagement with the drawings you discussed? On this, I really admire your final point about Parmigianino's self-portrait. Um, thank you, Ray. Uh, and I think the point is well taken, mirrors for sure. I mean, we don't know exactly, none of this is recorded specifically, but even, you know, the idea of tracing paper, which from Cennino Cennini was, there are recipes of making translucent papers for the kinds of tracing that could then be used to transfer designs onto printing plates. So that I think there's a lot of apparatus in the studio and in the printing uh, studio that allows this kind of reversal to be accelerated in different ways mechanically, um, which is to say that I think having access to, to mirrors and to tracing paper and to panes of glass, uh, give, gave Parmigianino even more access to the ability to play. Mm. Um, and sorry, just one uh, further point by Mary, Mary Vaccaro, um, who addresses um, her point to you, Akim, saying that, um, with respect, I would only ask that you give Bedoli a second chance <laughs> because he can be an exquisite draftsman, <laughs> which I think is a nice <laughs> comment from Mary. <laughs> um, And then Guido reminds also that yeah, Victoria, Victoria Colonna looked at Michelangelo's drawings with a mirror. Um, and, um, and yes, and actually uh, I would like to mention uh, the Michelangelo drawing that you mentioned, Amy, in your article uh, on this, where, yeah, incredibly, we have the uh, Christ on one side and use the same figure actually then for Titus uh, on the other side, which, uh, um, which is yeah, quite fascinating because I would have never thought that Michelangelo would uh, use that uh, that tool of a reversal um, or tracing through. Um, and then Charles says, drawings are sometimes rejected as originals due to a print executed in the same direction. Do you think that based on your scholarship, there are many drawings by other artists that can be originals? I mean, yes. Um, <laughs> I think that's a very big case by case, but yeah. maybe that's possible. And a question for Amy and Akim, how much do we, do we know about Parmigianino's drawing from life? Would he have drawn mostly from live models or invented anatomy, re reference other drawings, other prints? So I imagine drawing some prints by others, this is what is meant here. I think there are very few really studies after, after models, which we know from, from Parmigianino. We know them because we know that, for example, for, for the eve of the Staccata, he drew, for example, a male, a male body, a male model, which indicates that he um, had a model in front of his. But the problem is that he, while drawing, Parmigianino was trans transforming what he saw in, uh, in what he wanted to express in his uh, stylistic ideal. So he suddenly transformed what he, what he had seen, what he, what he did study in his uh, artistic item ideal. And, uh, but the real study of models as uh, Raphael and, and Michelangelo or Fra, Fra Bartolomeo did, uh, Parmigianino didn't use uh, anymore in his uh, working, uh, process. 
Yes, and I know, for example, uh, since we have that image in mind, because we, we've, sh we've seen it a few times today, that um, image of the woman seated on, uh, on the ground, which is in the Courtauld collection, yeah, that also uh, one where we sort of puzzled in the end, so <laughs> wanted to make um, a decision about is this really drawn from life or, uh, or not, um, as well as uh, the verso, which actually is more convincingly perhaps drawn from life, um, of um of the woman spinning um working a uh, thread of uh, um a bull uh on the back um and uh fena says uh, uh yes she fena asks he or she about um whether uh, there are any counterproofs of drawings and um yeah and amy showed one in, in one of the drawings where exactly you see that he started with the uh, um with a red chalk and then reworked the counterproof on the other side of the paper with uh with pen and ink um guido i know you wanted to um to say something um and uh I think, yeah, if you want to, to, to add something, since there are no more questions in the, in the chat. Well, uh, not really. I just wanted to, to thank the participants and the audience. And it would be nice, actually, if all the participants could uh, turn on their cameras. If they don't mind, that would be lovely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I would really want to thank you for, for your generosity for participating in this event and making your comments and really producing wonderful papers uh, that uh, enrich enormously our understanding of the artist. So I, I really want to uh, thank, and this seems to be a, a wonderful way of uh, kind of <laughs> completing our uh, endeavor to bring together people interested in this incredible artist and uh, to, 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 to renew an interest in him and to start again with new research as, you, as you've been doing. So thank you very much. Yes, I want to add my thanks to everyone and everyone who attended today. I hope we can be in touch more soon. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.